Good evening, baseball fans, and welcome to the beautiful Flathead Valley. My name is Scott Gladstone, and I'm so excited to be bringing you Pioneer League Baseball tonight. Tonight, Saturday, June 18th, 2022, the 22nd game of the 2022 season. Also, the inaugural season for the Glacier Range Riders in their first year of existence and playing their first Saturday night clash here at their home stadium, Flathead Field, and the second game ever against the Missoula Paddleheads. The Paddleheads come in with a record of 13-8 and eight after the loss last night to the Range Riders. The Range Riders, 8-12 and 12 to 9-12 and 12 after that 9-4 to four victory last night. Let's tell you a little bit about what happened last night, fill you in where the teams are at right now. And it starts, well, it starts with a home run in the top of the first yesterday from Jason Newman. As he cranked a two-run shot over the fence, soon, though, it would be a response. Four runs, including a two-RBI triple from Austin McNicholas, as well as RBI singles from uh, <coughs> excuse me, Austin McNicholas with the two-RBI triple, as well as in the first-ever professional at-bat for Justin Mazzone. He hit an infield single to bring home a run as well. It was 4-2 to two after that first inning. Eventually, we get down the line. It's 6-4, to four and we go into a rain delay. I mean, a lightning delay. Very different than a rain delay. Hard to have it here. A rain delay at Flathead Field. But it was a lightning delay because lightning was within 10 miles of the stadium. It was about an hour before we would resume play. And that's when the relievers came in and shut the paddle heads down. No hits and just two walks in the final four innings of Paddleheads offense. They absolutely suffocated the Missoula Bats. And that was Dawson Day and Justin Coleman with an inning each, and Tanner Solomon who pitched two, and they moved incredibly fast as well, so we actually didn't get out of here too late even with that one hour long rain delay. Most of the crowd stuck it out, saw some a couple more insurance runs, which made it a nine to four final. That's the reason why we have the Glacier Range Riders who come in in last place in the North Division. If they were in the South Division, they would not be in last. They would be in third. However, that's just not how baseball works. You get the luck of the draw and the North Division right now a lot more competitive than the South. They sit two games back of the Billings Mustangs for fourth and seven games back of the Idaho Falls Chucker for that first place spot. I already mentioned 13 and 8 are the Missoula Paddleheads. They are in third, just three games back of, excuse me, two games back of the Idaho Falls Chuckers. No, it's three. Typo in the game notes that I put together, so that's 1,000% on me. This is the second ever matchup. Of course, the first ever matchup was a last night between these Paddleheads and the Range Riders and Mission Mountain matchup number one goes to the hosts of last night's game. The Glacier Range Riders, of course, they'll play plenty of times in Missoula this year as these two are the closest teams to each other. A little bit further away is Great Falls where just a week ago the... Glacier Range Riders were playing at. They'll play plenty of times at Great Falls as well. And Missoula, they'll be back and forth all across the state of Montana as well as a handful of trips down to the other South Division opponent, the Idaho Falls Chuckers. The only South Division team that the Glacier Range Riders have on the schedule to go to was the, was the team in Colorado Springs, the Rocky Mountain Vibes. And they have already gone there. They opened the season there and went 5-1. and one, And they'll host the Boise Hawks here later this season, the other South Division matchup. Let's go over the starting lineup. We'll do it again in the first inning for those who tune in late. But real quick, Ben McConnell leads off. He is in left field. Sam Linscott's the center fielder. Logan, or excuse me, Livingston Morris is the DH. He returns to the lineup after two days off. Dean Miller bats cleanup and plays third base. Brody Wofford's the first baseman, batting fifth. Vinny Bologna is in right field. In the bottom three are Trevino, McNicholas, and Brant Broussard. On the other side for the visiting Missoula Paddleheads. 
It's Watley leading off. Thompson batting second. Newman batting third. Gatewood batting fourth. Greenwald batting fifth. Riley batting sixth. In the bottom three are Green, Perez, and Atkins. I think I saw a little bit of extra mustard on the applause when the starting introductions were read for Livingston Morris. As I mentioned, this is his return to the lineup. Just finished a 60-plus game college season with NAIA powerhouse Georgia Gwinnett. And as soon as his season ended there in the NAIA National Championship, or the National Tournament in Lewistown, Idaho, that's when him and a few of his teammates packed their bags and headed to the Flathead Valley. So a well-deserved couple days off after eight straight, ga straight games for Livingston Morris and a monumental performance in the first ever win over the Billings Mustangs, the first ever win at Flathead Field, a two-run homer in the bottom of the ninth and a home run to win it in the knockout round. We're going to take a short break for the national anthem. When we come back, we'll get underway. It's almost time to play ball here at Flathead Field. It's time to play ball here after the fans joined in the singing of the national anthem. And let's meet the hurler for the Glacier Range Riders tonight. It's Noah Barros. We're, Noah Barros, excuse me. We'll go over his stats for this season in a moment. But first, I'll tell you a little bit about where he comes from and what he has done before becoming a Range Rider. This is his first professional season. The rookie is from Holy Names. University is third. Played a solid game at first last night, but Brody Wofford, Wofford will be the first baseman in this contest, taking up his usual spot over there. And right now he's just having a casual chat with the first base umpire, who I'll tell you who that is. That's Robert Jamak over there. And back to the defensive lineman. Austin McNicholas is the shortstop. Brant Broussard plays second. He shows his versatility, he's played every infield spot for at least two games this season, other than first base. Ben McConnell is in left field. Sam Linscott's in center, and Vinny Bologna round out a speedy outfield. The designated hitter for the Glacier Range Riders is Livingston Morris. And the entire crowd says play ball and we are just about ready to get the first pitch here from Barros to Trevino. And standing in the left-handed batter's box will be Kevin Watley. Swung on and missed by Watley. We are underway, 7.04, first pitch here, 66 degrees. 
on a day where up until about an hour ago, there was a severe thunderstorm warning. It's another swing and a miss there. Now 0-2. We did have some showers sprinkled through. No tarp needed to be applied to the artificial turf, and you wouldn't know it if you just walked into the stadium that <laughs> there were thunderclouds and rain just an hour ago. This one right back to Barros. He fields and flips underhand over to first. 1-3 ground out gets us started in the top of the first. Cameron Thompson now, the second baseman, steps in. Barros just a three-pitch first at bat. Two strikes and then a ground out right back to him. Fires the first pitch to Thompson, who hits it to McNicholas at short. McNicholas fields, throws, four pitches, two outs. Now Jason Newman will step in. Jason Newman in the first inning. Last night had a man on first in the form of Lamar Sparks, and he absolutely yoinked one over the center field wall, the closest to straightaway center that we've seen a home run go here at Flathead Field. It is kind of a deep pocket out there, going all the way to 406 feet. Barros throws the first ball of his outing, misses just a little bit high. Count is 1-0. and It's not too easy to miss high to the big Jason Newman, standing 6'4", 280 pounds in the right-handed batter's box. Swings on that one over between the shortstop and the third baseman, so it will not be a 1-2-3 inning to start off the ball game as a single from Newman gets him aboard. We've had four games already here at Flathead Field, three against the Billings Mustangs and the one last night against the Missoula Paddleheads. Not once has a shutout been thrown in the top of the first. Barros trying to do exactly that, and that one will go over to Wofford, who will grab it, flip over to Barros, and Barros touches first base. It started off with a 1-3 ground out. It finishes with a 3-1 ground out. We head to the bottom of the first. 0-0 zero, zero between the Paddleheads and the Range Riders.
Domingo Pena is the man that steps on the bump for the visiting Missoula Paddleheads. Tonight, his record on the season, two wins, one loss, and a 5-5-2 ERA. The 24-year-old out of Tenaris in the Dominican Republic makes his fourth start and fourth appearance of the year. And like I just said, 2-1 and one has received a decision in each one of those ball games. They were 14 and two thirds, so an average of just under five innings pitched per game. That one misses away, and we're underway in the bottom half of the first. Ben McConnell, the man that leads it off, yet an RBI of the hit variety and of the base load of walk variety yesterday. Check swing there. No appeal over to first. I thought it was close enough for the catcher. Perez to maybe ask about it, but he does not. 2-0 now is the count. Base is empty, bottom of the first. Swung on by McConnell. It's carrying down the left field line, but foul. 2-1 and one now is the count. No outs, base is empty, bottom of the first. Pena steps, fires, misses up and away. Count is three and one. More of the stats on the season for Pena. This is second year. He had an absolutely outstanding season with the Paddleheads last year. Ten and one record in 21 starts. Swing and a miss there from Ben McConnell. Count goes full for the Glacier leadoff man. This season, 14 strikeouts to six walks for Pena. Last season, 130 strikeouts to 46 walks for the right-hander. He throws the payoff pitch, and it will miss away. He walks McConnell to lead it off, and that's his seventh walk of the year. Stepping up now, Sam Linscott. After a six-pitch first at-bat between McConnell and Pena. And I'm sure the Paddleheads are well aware of the speed that McConnell has over there at first. He takes a lead of about three steps off the bag. And first pitch is going into the strike zone. Called strike count is 0-1. Seven steals yesterday, a franchise single game record for the Glacier Range Riders. McConnell had two of them. Long pause on the mound and McConnell's trying to get another one but that one's going to hit Lynn Scott on the wrist not far away from the nub of the bat but it gets the wrist and McConnell Instead of having to steal second, he'll just get there the easy way. But you can tell the green light is on for the Range Riders with speed. And Livingston Morris steps up, and most of the crowd knows who he is because of his heroics on Wednesday night. And after two nights off, makes a return to the starting lineup and gets an applause from the hometown Range Riders fans. He's got two on and no outs here in the bottom of the first. Morris stands in. First pitch will miss low and in just off the shins of the right-handed outfielder. DH in a day, though. 1-0 is the count now to Morris. As he readies for the second pitch of the at-bat. Again, misses inside. That one was higher up, but Morris still... Waiting for a chance to swing. 2-0 and is the count. Pena glances at McConnell. A long stare. Looks back. And that one will just catch the inside corner of the plate, but he is definitely trying to avoid... The section in front of Livingston Morris that Morris can put barrel to ball because just like Newman on Pena's seat team, the ball can go out in a hurry. 
Thought about it, didn't go, and another inside pitch. They have a clear method of dealing with Morris, and that's just trying to scrape the inside part of the plate. Clearly, that was the scouting report to Michael Schlacht and the Paddleheads brought to the Flathead Valley. That one inside, a five-pitch walk to Morris. Bases will be loaded with no outs. And it's a walk, a hit-by-pitch, and a walk. And just like last night, trouble brews in the bottom of the first for the Paddleheads. They had four runs come across them in the bottom of the first last night. That was enough for a mound visit for the Paddleheads. This one, I don't believe, goes down as an official mound visit because it was just catcher and pitcher. No coach came out and had a conversation with Domingo Pena. But Dean Miller steps up. Base is loaded, no outs, bottom of the first. Miller receives and swings heavy at pitch number one. If he made contact with that one, <laughs> I think worst case scenario, it turns in to a sacrifice fly, but comes up empty, counts 0-1 now as Pena ahead for the first time in a while. 0-1. Another swing and a miss there. Counts now 0-2 for Miller. Stadium just got really quiet after that second swing and a miss there. As I think the crowd is just kind of waiting to explode on any sort of scoring play here. If Miller is able to do something with it. 0-2, no outs, bases loaded, bottom of the first 0-0 ball game. That one will miss and get by the catcher. The throw home is not in time and not received cleanly by Pena anyway. That one was off the glove of the catcher. I believe it'll go down as a passed ball. The count goes to one and two. And the Glacier Range Riders take a one to nothing lead over the Missoula Paddleheads. Everybody moves up 90 feet. Lynn Scott to third. And Morris moves into scoring position at second. One to nothing after the pass ball and not the flashiest of ways to score, but gets the job done for one. Still no outs, one, two coming in. Pena can still help his cause out a lot if he's able to get a strike out of Miller here. Misses low and inside. That is not a spot that Pena is hitting how he wants to. It's not a 1-2-3 clean inning from Barros in the top of the inning. He did have a hit by Newman that screwed up the 3-up, three 3-down, three but was able to get it out right after that to get through it in just four batters. That one inside. I thought that almost hit <laughs> Dean Miller, but it's a called strike three. It fooled me just as much as it fooled Big third baseman. And now Brody Wofford steps in. He's got two in scoring position. And one of them is his former teammate at Georgia Gwinnett, Livingston Morris, who stands on second. We've seen Morris score from second before on a base hit. But it was an unconventional score as he barreled over the catcher, and the catcher was called for blocking the plate. First pitch swinging. It's going to be foul down the first base line. Count goes to 0-1. Just a little bit ahead of that one. Beautiful day now here in the Flathead Valley. Already mentioned some late afternoon, early evening thunderstorms have made way for blue skies and some clouds. But you can see the blue skies at least. That one swung on, carrying out to left field. Tracking it down is Riley, who will dive and make the snag. It will work out as a sacrifice fly. That was right on the left field line, and it was a really great play by Riley. A difficult 
situation for him because there's almost a situation where if you're comfortable to that one and you see it go foul, you know Lynn Scott can score off the sacrifice fly. So as of now, you take the play, you lay out, you make the catch, and maybe you can just limit this to two runs in the bottom of the first. Sack fly makes it two to nothing in favor of the Range Riders. Vinny Bologna stepping up now for his first at bat. Batting in the sixth spot and playing right field. Missing low and in to start the at bat. Pena is behind 1 0. 2 0. Run scored on a wild pitch and then a sack fly from Brody Wofford. Long pause, and the pitch comes in. Big swing and a miss from Bologna. In his second game as a range rider over in Great Falls, he went yard in that one en route to a 14-0 range rider win, the first shutout win in franchise history. 1-1 one, one now is our count. And a swing and a miss there makes it 1-2. and two. One, two, two outs. Runner on second in Livingston Morris. The pitch from Pena. Swung on, foul ball. All the way over the concourse, up and out of play. And another one, two will be coming to the recent arrival just a week and a half ago from Fresno State University. Bulldog turned range rider. Pena kicks, fires, swing and a miss for strike three to get out of the bottom of the first, but it was two runs on no hits and no errors, using a couple free passes to get a pair of runs across. Greenwalt and Riley and Green are who we will see in the second inning. It's two to nothing. The Range Riders lead the Paddleheads. A hit was gotten off Noah Barros in the first inning, but other than that, he took care of business. Got three outs and no runs across him on the scoreboard. Now he'll see Keaton Greenwald, the center fielder for the Paddleheads, to lead off the top of the second. First pitch swung on, and it's going to be lifted over the head of McNicholas into left field for a base hit. One pitch, one on now, nobody out in the top of the second.
Now stepping up is Brandon Riley. Riley did not play yesterday for the Paddleheads. Stepping in now today as Michael Schlack makes a couple changes to his lineup. As the OO comes in. Pickoff attempt over to first. No tag applied by Brody Wofford. Just keeping Greenwald honest over there. Missoula, a team that likes to run a fair amount. As the OO comes in, misses up and away. Called ball. Count is 1 and 0. Oh. A total of 22 stolen bases for the Paddleheads, which is middle of the pack in the Pioneer League. The Range Riders are number one in the Pioneer League in stolen bases. As catching the runner Greenwald just in his second slide away from first there. So he wasn't far enough away, but he was a little bit off balance. Could have caught him in an awkward plant, but as the runner is now going, but it's a hit and run carrying out to center field, and this is going to be a chance for a double play. Back to first, Wofford grabs it, and the throw a little off line from Sam Linscott, but call it an 8-3 double play. Two gone in the bottom, in the top of the second. That is the moment when the hit and run backfires there. That one falls, it works out perfectly. You get runners on the corners with no outs. And said, the line drive to Lynn Scott and Greenwald not keeping his eye on the ball after contact was made. Cannot see that one go to the center fielder, but even so, that just allowed Lynn Scott a little bit more time to make that throw in and for Wofford to feel comfortable going off the bag instead of trying to stretch and keep his foot on first, he took a few steps off, grabbed it, and went and tapped the bag. 0-1 is the count now, 1-1. One one. Two away, base is empty. Top of the second here. It's Anders Green that's at the plate, the third baseman. Called strike there, count goes to 1-2. and two. The record on the season for the Paddleheads, 13-8. They're third in the... PBL North Division. Well, the Glacier Range Riders are in last place. Just gets a piece of that. Foul ball keeps Anders Green alive. It's Trevino, McNicholas, and Broussard, the bottom three in the Range Riders lineup that will lead off the bottom of the second when we get there. For now, Barros will take a deep breath, relax his shoulders, and now throw. Swing and a miss. Strike number three, Noah Barros. Gets down another clean inning of work. With help from the Linscott to Wofford double play, we head to the bottom of the second. It's two to nothing. Back here, sorry, that was a little bit louder than I have come on before, so I didn't blow you out there a little bit. Back here in the bottom of the second, and this is an offense for the Glacier Range Riders that two runs in the bottom of the first is not unexpected for them. Their ranks are a little weighted and a little thrown off by the fact they opened the season with six games in Colorado Springs. The Rocky Mountain Vibes have proven to be this season, at least so far, one of the Porter teams in the league as they have a record of 4-17 and 17 right now. One of those wins coming against the Range Riders, but 
the other five, with the exception of one 11 to six victory, it there were some there were some blowouts in there that definitely had uh, definitely had some effect on the stats. But the Range Riders are first in the PBL in two categories: sack hits as well as stolen bases. As Pena will start us off against Luis Trevino. Pitch goes high. Count is 1-0. and They're second in six, seven different categories. Batting average, runs, on-base percentage, doubles, RBIs, and extra base hits, as well as total bases. Before being, being third in hits, slugging percentage, and walks. Called strike. Their count is one and one, and that's just the team accolades. Ben McConnell right now, he is first in the league in stolen bases. And Logan Van Way, among pitchers that qualify first in the league in ERA. Foul ball there. Count goes to one and two. Luis Trevino recently joining this squad. We do have a roster transaction today. The Range Riders officially signed Kevin Kyle, a new pitcher from Georgia Gwinnett, going to start his rookie season at some point. This one's flying down the right field line. It's bending. It's going to be foul. Will it be caught? No. It just lands in foul territory between the foul line and the green padding that protects the bottom part of what will eventually be the away clubhouse. And I'll tell you what, I mean, the facility is beautiful already here, but one of the most things I'm excited for is the clubhouse slash office slash all-purpose facilities that are installed down each of these baselines. They're going to be, I mean, I think probably one of the best away clubhouses in the PBL, but the home clubhouse by far has the intention of being a really great place for the players to come to the ballpark and be when they're not on the field. A swing and a miss there, and Luis Trevino is down on a forwards K to start off the bottom of the second. And Austin McNicholas, the man who got a two RBI triple in his first inning yesterday, will step in, batting in the eighth spot tonight. I already mentioned first in stolen bases because Nick Hogan Loves to run. He loves to give these guys the green light. And as the first pitch is swung on and fouled back, he was a guy himself that when he played, he used his speed quite a bit. And clearly he has recruited players to the Range Riders that can do the same. McNicholas has really good wheels at short, but he's probably... Not even in the top three fastest guys in the lineup. As that one is fouled off the catcher, Perez goes down immediately. I think he's holding his shoulder. And we have the trainer coming out immediately. There is movement everywhere for him. He's just kind of rolling around, and hopefully it's just that surface pain and nothing deeper than that. The foul ball makes the count 0-2. And, and nobody out here, or excuse me, one out in the bottom of the second. While the trainers treat the catcher Perez, tell you a little bit more about the background of Domingo Pena, the starting pitcher for the Paddleheads. He was signed as a free agent as the catcher Perez is up kind of stretching out his right arm now going to have a couple tosses with the first baseman Jason Newman signed with the Texas Rangers and played for the Dominican League Rangers squad from 2015 to 2016 before making it into the Arizona League with the Rangers and then back to the Dominican League for the 2017 season before 
playing rookie ball with the Idaho Falls Chuckers, who were then an affiliate of the Kansas City Royals. Then he was out of baseball for three years, including that 2020 season that all of minor league baseball lost before reviving his career in an emphatic way last year with the Missoula Paddleheads and helping be a critical part of their run to the PBL championship. One and two is the count now. One out here, bottom of the second. It's two to nothing. The Range Riders lead the panel heads. Austin McNicholas, he's a one-two. That one will miss. Now two and two. Domingo Pena threw 25 pitches in that first inning. And he did not allow a hit. He currently has no hits against him, period. As that one will miss, count goes to three and two, though. In his 35 pitches, only 19 have been strikes. That's a 54% strike percentage. In the first inning, it was 52% strike percentage. As he loads the bases on a walk Hit by pitch, walk to start off the at bat. This one's fouled off. It's heading towards the rocks over in right field, and it will land there in the still uninhabitable construction zone in front of the kid zone there. Another 3 2 coming in to Austin McNicholas. Swung on and miss there as McNicholas becomes the second victim of a strikeout here. And the number nine batter, Brant Broussard, tries to make sure that Pena will not be able to strike out the side. As Broussard, another one of those speedsters on this team. That's the first thing pretty much I always say about the Baton Rouge, Louisiana native. Played for his hometown LSU Tigers. Up near the head. And the count goes to 1-0. Pena at 38 pitches. Something to keep an eye on. 1-0. Two outs. Base is empty here in the bottom of the second. Down the middle. Called strike. Count is 1-1. One Looking around the stadium right now, trying to take a gauge of if there's any Paddlehead fans in attendance. Don't see any anything crazy Paddleheady, if that's the verb that I just made up. That one misses. No, that's a adjective, not a verb. 2-1, two, two outs. Members of the front office came down yesterday, I believe, to take in the first ever battle between these two. That one misses. Now three and one for Brant Broussard. On deck is the top of the lineup, McConnell, Linscott, and Morris, if we get there. First McConnell, or excuse me, first Broussard will try and just stay alive long enough to pass the torch to Ben McConnell. The three one from Pena. Swing and a miss from Brant Broussard. Now it is three and two for the man that spent last year in the Pioneer League with the Billings Mustangs. Swung on, fouled back, up and out of play. We will do another one to Broussard, who right at the end of this season will turn 27 on September 1st. Originally started before he went to his hometown, Baton Rouge, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana State University Tigers, as he will earn a full count walk. Broussard started off his career at Delgado Community College, which is just down the road in New Orleans, the host of this year's Final Four in the men's basketball tournament. And he has spent plenty of time playing professional ball since. 
One season in the USBL, which is where McConnell played most recently in suburban Detroit. That was all the way back in 2019, however, as we get a pick off a throw over to Newman. He does not apply a tag as Broussard slides in. In that season, that first professional season for Broussard, as this one swung on foul down the left field line. Counts 0-1 now, two outs, runner on first in the bottom of the second. The Broussard played with both the East Side Diamond Hoppers and the West Side Woolly Mammoths. Those are, those are pretty good names. I mean, we've got a battle of two good names here with the Range Riders and the Paddleheads, but those are also very unique minor league teams. And the All-American Baseball Challenge, which was a COVID-induced pop-up league in New York. Brant Broussard was part of the New York Brave. And then last season, as I've already mentioned, in a handful of games, started the season in the Frontier League with the Tri-City Valley Cats before heading out to Montana. And that one struck well, but foul down the right field line as McConnell looked to go yard. That one <laughs> is in the is in where the building will be. So when construction resumes, maybe out there on Monday or whenever they start con or continue to work on that away clubhouse building down the right field line. They'll find a foul ball in there maybe if a fan doesn't get to it first. One, two, runner on first, two outs. McConnell faked a steal attempt. I was looking at him hard there because he, he just kind of had a feeling like he was maybe itching to go. and Maybe that's exactly why he Pulled that fake attempt to keep Pena on his toes. 2-2, two, two, two outs, runner on first, bottom of the second. McConnell at the plate, Broussard on first. Thought about it. Did not appeal to the third base umpire who is playing on the right side of second base. Not a, <laughs> not a view to see that one. Uh, but that's Rick Freitas that says that he did not go. 3-2, two, two outs. That means Broussard will be going on the pitch. From first, Pena sets, glances, and fires. Misses on the outside for ball four. The control has been the issue for Pena. No hits against him. But here he is with two outs in the bottom of the second. And two are aboard for the Range Riders as they get closer to the heart of the order. Sam Linscott, who has moved up in the lineup and found some comfort in the number two spot, made his debut playing in the six hole. Has went up to the five spot before now, being in the two spot for the last couple nights. 0-0 with two outs will come to him. He was hit by a pitch his first time up. Swung on, hit over to short of the field, and the throw is in time over to first. 6-3 put out, ends the inning. Two walks, put two on, but nobody scores. It's two to nothing. We head to the third.
It'll be Henderson Perez, the catcher, to lead us off here in the top of the third. Perez took that one off the shoulder, but seems to be okay after he worked it out, and now will come out and have his first at-bat, not just of the day, but of the series between these two as they're playing in their second game after the win 9-4 by the Range Riders last night. Called strike there. Count is 0-1 to Henderson Perez. After a great, great singing by the Range Riders fans of I want it that way. Called strike there. Count is now 0-2 on Perez. As Barros sets a kick and fire and it's high. Counts now 1-2 and two for Barros. The Glacier Range Riders in their home whites. The jersey and the pants, both a very clean white. Called strike three, a backwards K. Perez doesn't like it, and it doesn't matter. He has to take the walk back to the dugout. And the final batter we've yet to see, Jared Akins, now stepping in the right fielder. Bats in the nine spot out of the left-handed batter's box. Those clean whites that the... Range Riders are wearing. You can thank the two clubhouse managers, Josh Nichols and Brooks Krause, for the freshness that they are. Looks like they've never been worn before, but all the games except for last night's game at home here at Flathead, they have worn the home white. Last night, of course, they were in the Jammer Jersey Red. 0-1, one out. Another foul ball. That one narrowly misses the press box up here. As Akins has been on that two times. And sent it right to the similar place. First time hit the screen. That one just getting over the screen. 0-2. Check swing. And he went. Strike three. This time swinging. Backwards K. And a forwards K. We got two away in the top of the third. Nobody on. Kevin Watley will step up now. He, in his first time up, grounded out right back to the pitcher, Barros. Barros, I mean, Watley puts his toes right up on the line at the front of the batter's box. Pretty heavy into that plate. Watley squares to bunt, pulls back, called strike anyway. Now it's 0-1. He has a very unique uh, preparation that I don't think I remember seeing last night. Slowly tapping his toe with the tip of his bat as he does not do it there. 1-1. One that one will miss just low. It was Watley that was frustrated at one point last night when Tanner Solomon gave him a three-pitch strikeout. There he taps his foot again with the bat. Two and one, two outs, base is empty. And he swings and misses to make it two and two. I believe Watley's argument was that he didn't think he was fully set in the box, and maybe this is a new thing to counteract that and make sure they don't pitch while he's touching his toe. That one will miss inside. The knees buckle as Wally thought he might be hit by that one. He is pretty close to the plate. That one did not miss the strike zone by much. And again, Wally taps his toe and re readies to receive the 3-2. That one misses off the plate and it will be a walk for Wally to bring up Cameron Thompson. This is a Missoula Paddlehead squad that has a good offense, but they are really built on their pitching staff. Pitching-wise, in 182 innings pitched this year, which is one extra game than the Glacier Range Riders, they have a 5.19 ERA, which is over two points better than the Range Riders, a whip of 1.65. They've allowed just 105 earned runs as the pickoff attempt over to first is unsuccessful. 210 strikeouts, which is over 50 more 
than the Range Riders. They do have six more walks given up by their pitching staff, though. Dan Glacier, that one will miss low and away. Count is 1-0. and oh. Actually, that was just coming into today, and that has been the part for sure where Pena has struggled, so it's more than six now, as that was just the first walk given up by Barros. 1-0. Two outs, runner on first is Watley. That one is just tapped foul down the third base line. Count goes to one and one with two outs. Watley over at first, of course, batting in the leadoff spot. A fair, a fair bid to steal you would expect, but he is only 0 for 1 in steal attempts this year. So don't let his position in the lineup fool you too much. A pickoff attempt over there as Barros tries to keep him honest. Make sure he doesn't get his first successful steal of the year. Cameron Thompson takes another practice swing as he prepares to see the 1-1. One -one. Time called by Luis Trevino behind the plate. Thompson steps out and back in. 1-1, one -one, two outs. And another pickoff attempt over to first. As Barros not letting Watley get too far away from the bag. 1-1, one, one, two outs, Watley on first. Two to nothing ball game here in the top of the third. Cameron Thompson at the plate. Barros kicks. Not yet, not yet, not yet. Now he kicks and fires. Misses inside, count goes to two and one. Two one is fouled back. It'll make the count two and two. Mentioned the Range Riders, they're built on offense. 326 bat batting average to a 298 batting average. They have four less home runs than the Paddleheads, however. Two two, two outs. Runners going, swung on, fouled back. And Watley, two-thirds of the way to second base, will trot back. Another 2-2 will be coming to Cameron Thomas. Thompson, excuse me, grounded out too short his first time up. 2-2. Two -two. Barros, a long pause on the bump. Fires. Called, strike three, and a backwards K to finish off the inning. The walk to Watley screwed up a strikeout. Uh, oh, three up, three down, strikeout inning for Barros, but that'll do the trick anyway. All three outs were by way of the K, and we head to the bottom of the third, 2-0 in favor of the Range Riders.
Livingston Morris is the leadoff man in the bottom of the third. For Morris, he steps in with, of course, some really solid stats in his eight games played as a range rider. Is 0 for 0 because he walked his first time up, didn't get anything really to hit. The only pitch that was called a strike just glanced the inside part of the zone. Other than that, they were all pretty healthy misses inside to Morris. As again, that seems to be the plan. That one, a breaking ball that misses up near his chest. Six pitches to Morris, five balls. Make it six as that one misses low and away. Also a good bit off the plate. Eight games played, a 5-15 batting average, 17 hits, four doubles, and three home runs, including the game tying one in the bottom of the ninth on Wednesday. That one will miss as Morris thought about it. Didn't go, counts 3-0 and now. Eight pitches and eight or at seven balls to the right-hander. Swung and sent into left field, but the glove of Riley is there. The crowd, I think anything that comes halfway decent off Livingston Morris's bat, you just expect it to go yard. And for those who either were here or saw the postings on our social media after that game, it's uh, fairly reasonable to expect that because he has bat speed that is near the top of this lead, no of this league, no doubt. One out now, base is empty, bottom of the third. First pitch to Dean Miller will miss the strike zone, and the catcher count goes to one and zero. Miller. Another player as well, batting in the cleanup spot that has incredible bat speed, but a little bit late there. Not able to catch up with it. Swing and a miss makes it one and one. And there's a reason why he was the first player selected above Livingston Morris to be the batter in the knockout round. Wasn't able to go yard in that first round. Luckily, Billings wasn't either, so that is what preserved it to last to a second where Livingston Morris was able to go yard on the second swing and win the first ever knockout round for the Glacier Range Riders. Foul ball makes it one and two, one out bottom of the third. Dean Miller taps the plate, steps back in. Miller on the season, like Morris, three home runs. But he's been around two weeks longer, so he has 19 RBIs. That one's not going to be a home run or an RBI. He will walk back to the dugout after a called strike three. Domingo Pena, next pitch will be number 60 for him. That means even if it's an out, that's a 20 pitch, an inning, which is not the number that you want to see. On the other side, through three full right now, Barros is just over 10 pitches an inning at 34 pitches through three. Brody Wofford steps in. The final part of this three-headed monster that is very powerful in the middle of the lineup that Nick Hogan produced today. A lot more finesse once you get around the three, four, five batters, usually how it goes in baseball lineups. 1-0. Misses away. Counts now 2-0 with two outs. Bases empty here in the bottom of the third. There were two runners that did reach in the last inning on two walks with two outs. Didn't end up scoring, but it did extend the Inning a little bit longer and thus extended the pitch count of Domingo Pena, who's at 62 now as this one is 3-0 and to Brody Wofford. Make it 4-0. Four-pitch walk. Gets Wofford aboard on first base with the two-out base on balls. And again, Domingo Pena struggles with that control. He's pitched really well apart from that. He's not allowed to hit. And he's... Falling behind 2 nothing. Hard to knock him too much because when he puts it in the zone, it has not been cracked by the Range Riders thus far. But again, there misses the zone. Count goes to 1-0. Vinny Bologna 0-1, struck out 
swinging in his first trip to the plate. That one skips in the dirt, Brody Wofford. No chance for him to go on that one as the great thing for catchers that I assume they appreciate about this artificial turf is the fact that there's no uh, <laughs> there's no randomness that you can get with uh, how the dirt can be with those balls there. That one's called a strike count goes to two and one, two outs, two to nothing here, bottom of the third. Wofford on first with Vinny Bologna at the plate. Pitch number 67 coming in from Domingo Pena. Swung on by Bologna. Fouled back. 2-2, two, two, two outs. One on as Trevino stands in the on-deck circle. McNicholas in the hole if we get there. The next inning will be led off by Newman, followed by Gatewood and Greenwall. Low and in. Count goes three and two. Wofford over at first will be running on the pitch. Pena, a long pause on the mound, and he steps off to make sure that Wofford wasn't going on first movement there. Wofford, <laughs> he's not going to swipe a thousand bags on you. Casually jaunts back to first. And he actually inches a little bit closer to first here, not wanting to get picked off on a 3-2 to end the inning. Pena finally will throw. And a foul ball means that at least 70 pitches will be thrown total by Pena. No action in the bullpen for the Paddleheads. They expect Pena to be able to, go, able to go pretty deep with his arm and his experience as a starter. And that's not really the problem for Slack. I think he's more just a little bit worried about the inconsistent control that he's seeing from Pena in the early part of this game. Another 3-2. Wofford runs. Swung on by Bologna. That one's carrying out to left field. Goodbye, baseball. A full count home run by Vinny Bologna. Makes it 4 to nothing. The lead is doubled for the Glacier Range Riders. That one landed right at the foot of the scoreboard. Riley, the left fielder, pretty much looked at it, took about a step and a half before realizing it wasn't worth the run because that ball is under the scoreboard and into the trees behind left center field. Just a little bit to the left of the 375 side, probably about a 380-foot home run or so, if I'd had to guess. The Fresno State product goes yard for the second time this season. Trevino wanted to maybe follow that up with a good hit of his own. And what a way to break a no-hitter there, as that is the first hit, and it's a four-base hit. Gets Wofford to score and, of course, the hitter, Bologna. Called strike there on the inside corner. To Trevino, who's 0 for 1 with the strikeout. One and one is the count for this next pitch with the bases empty. That one's upstairs, has to get Trevino to turn away. Count will go to two and one. Trevino started this season with the Grand Junction Rockies, was released by the squad there in western Colorado before being picked up by the Glacier Range Riders. Missing away there as now Pena as you sometimes see pitchers do in response to giving up a home run, hesitant to fill up the strike zone. 3-1, two outs, base is empty for Luis Trevino. It's 4 to nothing in favor of the Glacier Range Riders after the Vinnie Bologna two-run home run. Swung on. 
Swung on by Trevino, gets under it and lifts it up and over the completed luxury suite side. This facility, there's a lot to be said about it. And <laughs> if you're, whether you're a Paddleheads fan or a, a Range Rider fan that's going to be tuning in all season, you're going to hear me talk about all different parts of it. But the upper level concourse area is definitely what's really exciting. And speak of the devil, that one goes right over near the concourse area, much closer to the kids zone, though. And just gets on the other side of the fence. So the kids running up there to try and get it will only be able to desperately watch it through that construction fence that's still up. I believe the plan is by the end of the month to have the kids zone ready there. So maybe that general admission is as well. Swing and a miss by Trevino. He's down on a strikeout. And he's 0 for 2 today. Newman, Gatewood, and Greenwald will lead off the fourth inning. But it's the two-run home run by Vinny Bologna. That doubles the lead, makes it 4-0 Range Riders as we head to the fourth. Top of the fourth here. It is four to nothing in favor of the Glacier Range Riders. We head to the fourth inning of play, and it's Jason Newman, the powerful first baseman, to lead off his second time facing Noah Barros. Barros will set now kick and fire to the right-hander, who will see strike one in the zone to make it 0-1 here to start the fourth inning of play. A Vinny Bologna two-run home run. The highlight of this contest thus far just happened in the bottom of the third. That's the reason why it's 4-0 after two runs in the bottom of the first as well. That one is hit to shallow right field and will one hop into the glove of Bologna. And another single by Newman, who right now has two-thirds of the hits for the paddle heads. As he's two for two with two singles. I told you, he's powerful, but the stats will back me up when I say that the Cal State, Cal State Northridge player, that one's swung on. A chance for two. Miller throws for one. The throw for two is not in time. Just goes down as a fielder's choice as... It was an interesting defensive alignment where Dean Miller charged that ball, had to kind of throw that awkwardly to second base. And in a way where he was just making sure that he got that one on target because there was nobody to back it up. Could have possibly scored a run if I uh, got by the second baseman. So just making sure that he gets the fielder's choice in on that one. 
It goes down as a 5-4 fielder's choice for out number one. Now a new runner on first. Pickoff attempt over to first. No tag applied. Miller, I mentioned it yesterday when he played first base and gave Wofford the day off in the field. A very versatile player. We've seen him go all the way from the outfield to third base to first base now. Yet to see him pitch. And we'll have to figure out how likely that is. That's, that's my real question. Another pickoff attempt over. Another instance where no tag was applied by Brody Wofford. 1-0 is the count to the man up at the plate now, Keaton Greenwald, who has the other hit. That's not by Jason Newman for the Paddleheads. Three hits. Two of them belong to the Paddleheads first baseman. That's a high fly ball carrying down the left field line. Running over to it is McConnell. He runs out of room. And the ball goes foul. One and one, one out. For Noah Barros, at least according to the stats that I have, no summer league ball for him. So this is kind of this summer league is a, a good experience in terms of, of course, making sure you're continuing to play and improve every day. That wasn't really an issue for Noah Barros as he did clearly improve year to year, resulting in striking out 110 for a record. As this one's over to Barros, or I mean over to Miller. Miller will throw across the diamond, but just not enough on it. And an infield single there. Gets Keaton Greenwald aboard. He's two for two, as is Newman. They are the entire offense pretty much for the Paddleheads right now, but Greenwood stands in scoring position. Gatewood, excuse me, stands in scoring position. As Greenwald pushed him there on the infield single. Like I was saying with Barros, the college ball is a lot different than summer ball. However, in terms of just the fact college ball, usually maybe you have one midweek game and then a couple over the weekend. And of course that varies from week to week, but still you get a day off or two. You get probably at least three or four days off a week from playing baseball. The collegiate summer ball experience, especially in, you know, very minor league-esque settings like the Northwoods League, the West Coast League, and others, <laughs> you... You get that feel of minor league baseball where you are suiting up, going to the ballpark every day, and not much else you can do other than think about the game of baseball. And you also really bond with your teammates quick. Again, I may be mistaken that Barros hasn't played it, but he's done other things in the summer, probably just individually worked on his craft, as a lot of pitchers do, to prevent possible injury. This one is hit to second, tag applied. The throw over to first is in time. That's a 4-3 double play to end the inning. A great defensive play. Keeps a solid outing going for Noah Barros. We'll be right back for the bottom of the fourth.
Austin McNicholas will lead off the bottom of the fourth. He struck out swinging in his first time up against Domingo Pena. We're starting to get some bodies up and moving around that bullpen for the panel heads. Nothing going on down the left field line of the bullpen for the Glacier Range Riders. As Barros has been strong thus far, pitching a clean sheet. And that one misses. Count is 2-0. and Pena, for the most part, has missed fairly close to the zone, but there has been stretches where, you know, he has thrown a four-pitch walk here or there where nothing has really been even close enough to consider a strike. That one, McNicholas close, considers close enough to consider it a strike, so that's why he swings on it, fouls it away, counts two and one. No outs here, bottom of the fourth, four nothing in favor of the Range Riders. Swung on, this one's dribbled down the third baseline. Going to be a tough play ha in the glove and over to first and an infield single as Green can't make the play on that one. Pretty much the only thing he could have done there to beat out the speed was basically barehand that to scoop it into the glove and then transfer it to his hand. That just took that extra half second that he couldn't afford with the speedy McNicholas moving down the first baseline. An infield single puts one aboard with no outs. McNicholas, the first time he reached base in his professional career, it was on a play just like that that was then skied over first base. This one is on the inside. Broussard squared to bunt, but then spun out of the way. Counts 1-0 and for Broussard. Broussard on the other time, I was talking about Barros not playing summer ball, as, like I said, a lot of pitchers don't do to preserve the longevity of their arm and minimize the wear and tear as that one misses. Counts now 2-0, and 82 pitches for Pena. As now we get a lot more serious warm-ups happening over in the on-field bullpen down that right foul side for the paddleheads. It's a left-hander, but I don't have a great view on the number from where I'm at. 2-0 is the count coming into Broussard. As that one missed on the inside, now 3-0 to the right-hander. While at LSU, his two years with the Tigers, he spent a summer in Danville in the Prospect League as well as with the Wisconsin Woodchucks in Wausau, Wisconsin of the Northwoods League. Thought about going there, but probably had the red light on the 3-0. Counts now 3-1 and one with no outs. Broussard walked his first time up, was stranded on the base paths. 3-1 coming in, no outs, runner on first, swings on that one, carrying out to center field, backing up is Greenwald, but he will get a read on it and snag it on the run and throw it in. McNicholas will scamper back to first, fly out to the center fielder, means one gone in the bottom of the fourth. Ben McConnell comes up now. He has not registered an official at bat today because he's just been given the free pass to first each time he's been up. Two walks for the Kaiser University alum. Cracks that one hard down the first base line. And one of those quirks about the on-field bullpen is you have to have a protector over there. And the protector there <laughs> failed to get to that one. <laughs> but it luckily was running out of enough steam that it didn't get in the way of the southpaw warming up for the paddleheads. 0-1 coming in now after McConnell cracked that first one foul. Breaking ball in there, drops right into the zone. Great pitch from Domingo Pena, 87 on the day for him. Clearly, he is close to expiring. Pitch over to first, decent chance to get McNicholas there, but McNicholas quick to head back to the bag. Count is still 0-2 for McConnell. Swings on that one, sounded like a broken bat, and McConnell not happy with himself as that one just falls into the glove of the shortstop, Watley, and 
Yes. McConnell didn't even drop the bat. All he did, he felt it break, and then he hit it into the turf in frustration. He's not happy with himself after that at bat, but now two outs with Lynn Scott coming to the plate. First pitch to Lynn Scott fouled back. Counts 0 and 1. Control issues early, a walk, a hit by pitch, and a walk loaded the bases for the Glacier Range Riders before two of those runs were able to get across in the bottom of the first and the two run home run by Vinny Bologna made it four to nothing. That one is hit into right center field. Running to third is McNicholas and a single will put runners on the corners for the number three batter, Livingston Morris. Well, we've seen the clutch gene from Morris already, and this isn't the bottom of the ninth, but the bottom of the fourth with runners on the corners and a chance to extend a lead on a tired pitcher. And right here, it's exactly the moment that Michael Schlack said, maybe let's talk about this at least. He hasn't taken the ball from Pena yet. He hasn't signaled to the bullpen yet. But it's a... Time for a conversation, that's for sure. I've already mentioned Morris, who's 0 for 1 today, so his batting average goes down a little bit. 30 hits in, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong stat sheet. That was Lamar Sparks, who has 30 hits in 73 at-bats, and he's the top batting average guy for the Paddleheads, the top batting average for the Glacier Range Riders. Just 17 hits in 34 at-bats now. So exactly 500 is Livingston Morris with those three home runs, those nine RBIs. He gets a base hit here. He'll be in double figures in the RBI category in his professional career. Michael Schlack trusting one of his best pitchers. Led him to a 10-1 record last year and was a crucial part of that PBL championship. Schlack gets into the dugout, takes a turn to his assistant coaches there. And is... Clearly in discussion with them right now. We'll see if he lives to regret the decision to keep Pena in there instead of switching him out for the left-hander, warming up in the pen. Oh, oh, coming in. Morris wanted to go, but he holds off. Count now is 1-0 and for the slugger. Big swing and a miss for Morris. That was going nowhere other than over the wall. With that one, couldn't connect. Count goes to one and one with two outs. Runners on the corner, McNicholas. Of course, speed doesn't really matter in this situation with two outs, but he has some over at third. Lynn Scott can really boogie from first. Another swing and a miss from Morris, who freezes in his full swing position. Crowd gives a smattering of applause here to try and give something to Morris in the one-two. Two outs, runners on the corners. Pena fires it and entices a swing and a miss out of Morris who comes up empty with the runners on the corners jam for Pena. He gets out of it, likely the end of the day for him, but we'll wait to read the book on him until we get to the bottom of the fifth. We will be right back. It's four to nothing as we head to the fifth inning of play.
Noah Barros out for his fifth inning of work in stark contrast to his starting pitching counterpart, at least thus far. 41 pitches thrown by Barros in comparison to the 94 that Domingo Pena threw in the same amount of time. And he will face Anders Green, the number seven batter and third baseman. And first pitch will be fouled into the dugout of the Paddleheads, 0-1. Big reason for that lowering of the pitch count is the strike percentage. 20 percentage points better, 73%, 74% actually for Barros to 53% for Domingo Pena. And make it even higher now for Barros who gets a swing and a miss. Out of Anders Green behind 0-2 now. Struck out swinging in his first trip up to the plate. Fires that one up and away. Count is one and two. It feels like that's the only time that Barros, Barros excuse me, is throwing a ball is when he has a waste pitch on 0-2. Other than that, he really tries to just blow up the strike zone. One, two coming in. Swung on and missed. And another strikeout for Noah Barros, who has been absolutely on fire today for Barros. Just four and a third innings pitch. That's five Ks for the rookie out of Holy Names. Henderson Perez, the catcher now, stepping in. He is 0 for 1 with a strikeout looking. That one will miss inside. Thought for just a second it might have skimmed Perez. But he gets his hands out of the way just before it blows by him. 1-0 is the count. Called strike as that one covers the plate. And the catcher, Perez, I don't think liked it. I, th I think he he was saying something. I don't know if it was directed to the umpire at frustration with, him, with himself there. As we get an appeal over to first on that one. That was... Fairly audacious attempt to add an appeal by Trevino. I don't think that was much more than a flip from my angle, but might as well try it. 2-1, one, one out, bases empty here. Top of the fifth, 4 to nothing. The paddle heads trail the Range Riders. Missing load there. Now it's 3-1. and one. Hitters count for the number eight batter, Perez. Three, one, one out. Swung on and missed. A little bit of a late swing there by Perez, who realized he was getting one close enough to the zone to entice him, but just decided that a little bit too late. Couldn't catch up with it. 3-2, one out. Barros sets and fires. Misses low, and he will walk the number eight batter and bring up the number nine batter, Jared Akins. Struck out swinging his first time up. Getting his second crack now at the plate is Akins playing right field today. Saw him yesterday as well, as well, the Cal State Fresno product. Altadena, California was a part of the squad for the Paddleheads last year, that PBL championship squad that trounced through the competition. That one will miss, not by much, however. The record last year, they won both halves of the Pioneer League season, and that is how the PBL is split up. Then the first half winner plays the second half winner of each division in the first round of the playoffs, and then the winner of that matchup goes on to the championship game. 1-0 and coming in. Swung on, piece of it, caught by Akins, but it's fouled back. 1-1, one and one, one out. That's a great way that minor league baseball works where a lot of teams do that because, you know, the player pool can shift so much based on who's signing who and who's moving there. And, you know, to keep the fans engaged, you can get a reset button at the midway point in the season and they can create a playoff chase 
late as the season dwindles to a close. Strike there, it was called. But Aikens checked his swing anyway, so even if it missed the zone, I think it still would have been called a swinging strike on Aikens. But home plate umpire Patrick Rivera just said it hit the zone anyway. 1-2 now coming into Aikens. Barros fires that one up near the hands. Count now goes to 2-2. Two and two. Perez not looking like he's much of a threat to steal over there at first. Well, we've not seen any attempts by him this year. Swung on. That one's carrying down the right field line, but it's going to drift foul. Good wood put on it by Akins, but just a little bit ahead of it. And another 2-2 will be coming with one out here. Runner on first, top of the fifth inning. Four to nothing. The Range Riders lead the paddle heads. Two two called strike three. Akins doesn't like it, but the home plate umpire Patrick Rivera's opinion is the only one that matters. A backwards K, the sixth of the day for Noah Barros, and he's one out away from getting through five. And it's Kevin Watley who <laughs> he is just a character when he comes up to the plate. A very unique stance in general. But he does do the tap of the toe there. There was only one time when he set for it that I didn't see a tap of the toe the last time up. Oh, swing and a miss there. He's behind 0-1 with two outs and a runner on first. Another tap. And then a slow wind into his stance. 0-1 is... <laughs> Barros, <laughs> I think, trying to play chess, not checkers. He takes his time getting into his set position, and time is called as both players will, in slow motion, get ready for the 0-1. Off the plate. Count now goes to 1-1. One one. Whitley, excuse me, Watley, walked his first time up, ground, grounded out back to Barros to start off the game. He's got Perez over at first, running on contact with two outs, but as we mentioned, no stolen bases to his name. So we'll see how far he can get with his wheels if that contact is made. That one's swung on, no contact there. It's one and two now. Barros just hit 60 pitches, so still low. And it would be great for him to get out of the inning right here with no more thrown. Continue to set himself up to go even deeper into this contest. But he's got to deal with Watley first. The one-two with two outs and a runner on first. Barros sets, fires, foul ball. If there is a new pitcher coming in for the Paddleheads, he has completed his warm-ups and is ready to come out of the dugout and into the ball game. As there's nobody throwing over there. So maybe there, uh, there's definitely one player standing up right off the simulated bump over there in the bullpen. One, two, just missed. The crowd wanted it. Didn't get the benefit of the doubt on the call. Count goes to two and two with two outs. That one was awfully close, and the Saturday night crowd here, maybe one of the best in Flathead Field history, a short history since Tuesday of Flathead Field, 2-2. That one gets the call from the home plate umpire, a backwards K for Noah Barros. He is through five, and Perrin threw it at that. We'll be right back for the bottom of the fifth.
Well, between the four, between the top of the fifth, the bottom of the fifth, every. And between the, what am I saying? Between the top and the bottom of the fifth, every day, every game here at Flathead Field, there is a tractor racing contest. And it seems that they are, I don't know what the situation is here, but every time the person, the kid that is racing to Huck, the bear, over on the right field line, seems to win every time. I don't know if somebody's rigging this against Cliff, the mountain goat on the left side, but it is uh, tough, tough sledding for Cliff thus far. We got a new pitcher for the Missoula Paddleheads. The man stepping on the bump is that southpaw that was warming up for the entirety of the last inning and finished warming up in the top of the fifth. It's number 31, Jason Munch. Munch is, of course, a left-hander. Went to school at Concordia. He's a California native from Campbell, California, and was in the Brewers organization and most recently played for the Carolina Mudcats. This season, the left-hander has had the roughest go of any of the Missoula Paddleheads pitchers, and it is a very good staff, so having the roughest go of him still doesn't mean you're that low on the totem pole in the big scheme of things, but a 9.82 ERA in four appearances. He has started three times. It's only his second time coming out of the pen. 14 and two-thirds innings pitched, 19 Ks to 10 walks. First pitch to Dean Miller, swung on and missed. Count goes to 0-1. Give you the final line on Domingo Pena, a man who didn't pitch all that bad, but we'll get to the category that if you were paying attention, you'll know it's going to be the one that will stick out for him today, the reason why he exits with a deficit. 0-1. That one hurled into the zone. Counts now 0-2. Four innings pits, pitched for Pena. Three hits allowed, which is a great number in four innings. The problem is the whip just blown up by the five base on balls from the right-handed starter. Three of those runs go down as earned. That one goes way high up and over. The one that goes down as unearned is because of a passed ball that... Scored Ben McConnell to start this scoring by the Range Riders. Four runs in general. I mean, that's an ERA of nine in the game. Without the, if they were all four earned. But like I just said, they're not. <laughs> so his ERA less than three on the game. That one misses low and in. Count is two and two. The ERA on the game was 6.75 for Pena, allowing three earned in four innings. Seven strikeouts, definitely a great number in four innings. 12 out of seven outs were by way of the K. The problem is, is that one's failed off. The five walks and the hit by pitch. Clearly a stain on the resume for Pena. He leaves in line for the loss unless his team can tie this one up or take the lead. Then it will be on the next pitcher to inherit that situation. But the 2-2 will come in. That one looked like it might have been high, but protecting the plate is Dean Miller, and he fouls that one off. Count stays 2-2. Two and two. A high leg kick before it's hit over to short. And going down one knee, not being able to make the play, is Watley. He was sliding over there to get that one, I assume, because of the slide. It would have been a really difficult throw from the deep hole out there in shallow left. Call it a single for Dean Miller. And it does go down as that, as the fourth hit is put on the board. So Dean Miller now one for three on the day. Brody Wofford has not registered 
an official at bat, a sack fly, and a walk for the first baseman. That one hits the zone, called strike count is 0-1. Let's give you a little Pioneer League scoreboard update for those who are interested. The first place in the North Division, Idaho Falls Chuckers, currently trailing the Ogden Raptors. If results hold there, the Range Riders can gain a game on the first place team, get within six. Again, if the result holds in both games, that one catches the outside edge of the plate. Count is 0-2. We already have a final as the Northern Colorado Owls defeat the Grand Junction Rockies. That's an all-Southern Division affair. The Boise Hawks taking it to Rocky Mountain right now, 10-2 in the top of the fifth. And the Billings Mustangs lead the second place in the North Division. Great Falls Voyagers 6-1 in the bottom of the fourth over in the Electric City. 0-2. Off the plate, Wofford wanted to protect, but confident that one would miss. Wofford out of Rome, Georgia. The one, two into the left hander. Fouled off. We'll do one, two, one more time. One, two, up and in, moving his arms out of the way of it. Count goes to two and two. Already talked a little bit about Jason Munch's background, but he did play his college ball at Concordia University, Nebraska. There's about a Concordia University in every state, so should have clarified that further. Originally from California, and the runner Miller's going. He's caught in a pickle. And it'll be 3-6, and he gets back into first safely. Dean Miller escapes the pickle. And it would have been, if that tag would have been successfully applied by Munch, it would have gone down as a 3-6-1 play, but instead it just goes down as a pickoff attempt that's unsuccessful. The crowd enjoying that one here. Count is 2-2. Two and two. Jason Munch, the left-hander, playing at the NAI level. So he's played at the same level as a lot of these NAI players that we've seen on the squad for the Glacier Range Riders. That one's fouled back. No netting there. Would have been right into the window of my booth. 2-2, Two -two, it stays. He did sign... As a free agent, I already mentioned, with Milwaukee. Lasted a little bit in the low A East last year. Just a little under two months with the Carolina Mudcats. Called strike three there. Wofford groans with a displeasure, but it is one gone in the bottom of the fifth. Over his college career with the Concordia Bulldogs. A 17-9 record, 2.78 ERA, and 184-plus innings pitched. 281 career college strikeouts and 89 walks. Pickoff attempt over to first. This one a little less exciting than the last pickoff attempt that almost got Miller out. So rare that you see... Players escape the pickle these days. But Miller played that just about as good as you can, especially when you know he's got good wheels, especially for his size as a power hitter. So he misses in low uh, in low and inside. 1-0 to Bologna, who homered his last time up, brought home himself and Wofford. But it is, yeah, incredibly difficult to... Deal with the pickle, but Miller, the highlight of the inning thus far. 
This one up the chimney. It's going to be a souvenir for the fans behind home. It'll one hop and caught by a fan off the hop. Great job there by a man in a black coat. Sorry you missed that one. If you want to have a chance for a souvenir, a souvenir, you, you got to come out to the ballpark. And tomorrow will be a great day for it if you're a Paddleheads fan or a Glacier Range Riders fan. Father's Day matinee clash here. And your chance to get a souvenir. That one misses off the plate. Count is two and one. That ignited the crowd a little bit, just like that Dean Miller pickle. Sometimes you don't just come for the home runs like they saw from Vinny Bologna. You come for the chances when you get a foul ball and chances to see the rarer plays as we get a pickoff attempt over to first. That one, a little bit sketchy there. Playing with fire, you don't want to, you don't want to give the umpires any reason to possibly call you for a balk there. It's kind of like Munch almost got caught in the middle there, but not enough to get called for a balk and advance Miller to second. It's been so long that he was set on the mound there. That time was called. A 2-1 coming in to the man who hit the two-run homer to make it 4 to nothing. Munch last year with Carolina, 1-1 record, a 6-3-9 ERA. As that one is hit, and it gets right to second base. And I don't know why Thompson didn't didn't throw to first there, or didn't throw to second, as he was maybe shielding himself a little bit from the sun or something that's setting over the dugout. But Miller hesitated on that line drive to second, and because he didn't, if it was caught out there in second, he would have been doubled off. So he he hesitated there. So that gave Thompson plenty of time to get the force of the lead runner, but he just hops to go safe and get the 4-3 ground out. And now hope that it doesn't come back to haunt him. Munch there, just a little miscommunication maybe by him with his catcher trying to get it clear. He very obviously pointed at the runner, pointed at second base. First pitch swung on a foul back. Count his own one. A weird inning here. Forgive me for <laughs> feeling like I'm playing catch up sometimes. As this is game five out of six straight home games to start off the stadium, the all time home outings for the Glacier Range Riders. It has been a whirlwind week as well as basically the week before which was all hands on deck to prepare this stadium for a liftoff less than a week before the first game there were still hard hats being worn around the facility because of the active construction going on but what a job from top to finish done by everybody involved with this organization to get the job done and open this park for limited capacity baseball, but limited capacity still seems like a heck of a lot. Check saying there, it was in the zone, says the home plate umpire, and Luis Trevino is behind 0-2. Trevino only has one game under his belt as a Glacier Range Rider. 0-2 coming in, fouled off, staying alive is Trevino. He has not been able to get his first hit as a Glacier player. Has walked once, so not a 0-0-0 on base percentage. But the McClellan, Texas native, still looking for his first hit in the Flathead Valley. 0-2 coming in. Munch, a long pause. 
Two long looks at Miller. And that one is hit up the middle. Charging in is the center fielder who will not throw home. It's safe at the plate. The first hit as a range rider. For Luis Trevino is an RBI single that scores Dean Miller and that failed pickle earlier in the inning coming back to haunt Munch and the paddle heads there. It's five to nothing in favor of the hosts. Austin McNicholas now steps in. Trevino is on first after that RBI single. A couple defensive miscues. Maybe you could call that a defensive miscue from Thompson there who didn't field that grounder to him cleanly as that one is hit and he fields that one just fine. Goes and taps second himself for the force out fielder's choice at second unassisted by the second baseman. But one coming across on the Trevino RBI single. It is five to nothing in favor of the Glacier Range Riders. The man who finished off the last half inning by tapping second, Cameron Thompson, is the man that steps up here to start off this inning, a ground out and a strikeout for Thompson, who will be seeing Barros for the third time. It is five to nothing. We are in the top of the six between the Paddleheads and the Range Riders. Thompson stabs that one foul, just about two feet to the right of the first base bag. Good contact on it, good power on it, just a little bit early. Count is. 0-1 now with no outs. Barros, 63 pitches in the first five innings of work. He's in line for the win if the Range Riders can retain the lead. 65 upcoming. And it's down Main Street for strike number two. Due up in this inning, Thompson, Newman, and Gatewood. That one just misses on 0-2, not very far away. And now the 1-2 will come in. Another one that just missed. Same exact spot as that 0-2 pitch. That made a 1-2, and now it's 2-2. Thompson, bats from the left, can handle most parts of the infield. Swings on that one and fouls it down the first baseline, still 2-2. Two -two. Stands 5-11, played his college ball at Kansas State University, did the Clear Lake Texas native. 
and he's been all over. Summer ball has been a big part of this conversation, and he's played in three really highly regarded summer collegiate baseball leagues. Owens back up the middle. Going to be a tough play for the second baseman, and it will not be made by Brant Broussard, who would have had to throw off his back foot. I believe you can call that one an infield single for Cameron Thompson. Jason Newman now two for two. He can change this game with one swing of the bat. And he will do his best to step in and do so. Thompson, the three leagues that I mentioned, highly regarded that he played summer ball in. The Alaskan Baseball League, which Rob Hamby also played in. He played for the Anchorage Glacier Pilots. And then two years with the Harwich Mariners in the Cape Cod League. Finishing off with the Waterloo Bucks in the Northwoods. Swing and a miss there. Count goes to 0-1. Northwoods, the same league that Brant Broussard, who he just got that one by, played in when he played with the Wisconsin Woodchucks, who actually just rebranded to the Wausau Woodchucks to be a little more localized. A one. Swing and a miss from Newman. And now Barros has a lot of options on 0-2 to try and fool the Californian first baseman. Check swing, appeal over to first, and they said he didn't go. Just a fraction of a foot, essentially, by how far that bat needed to go. But Newman just held off on it. 1-2 now coming in to Jason Newman. Morrow sets fires, misses low, counts 2-2. Two and two. <laughs> Newman, the reason, he, he just has such a great look that kind of fits Missoula. There was a feature on the opening week of the PBL Roundup show by host Tom Brenneman where he was in, in Missoula shooting a segment with Jason Newman and, and a few other members of the team as well as the front office staff runners going. Foul ball is going to. Forced the runner Thompson to head back to first. And I tuned in midway through this segment that was airing, and it was at seemingly some local Missoula brewery. And for the longest time, I, I thought Thompson was, or I mean, I thought Newman, excuse me, was a just kind of a member of the front office or something like that, maybe a member of the promotional team or something. thought he was just a Missoula native that was working for the baseball team. He has become really involved in it and while the paddleheads do not quite have the national acclaim of the Savannah Bananas I think they really do a good job at being motivated by giving fun to the players and the fans as well as giving a voice to the players and to the fans 2-2 Two -two. swung on foul ball down the left field line by Newman. As it will be called foul there. Ben McConnell didn't do a great job of selling that one as he stopped at the wall about a, uh, I don't know, five feet to the right of the foul pole. So he stopped at the, at the wall in fair territory, which can fool an umpire into thinking that ball went right over the head where he stopped at the wall. It had enough carry on it, but the question was, was it going to be foul or fair? And it looked foul off the bat for me, and that's why I was fairly confident in saying so. Another pitch coming from Barros, who just had 75 runners going, and that one hits the batter, Newman. And all the way on 0-2, when Newman had that check swing, that was called a no swing by the first play base umpire, that call comes back to haunt the Glacier Range Riders as now eventually Newman reaches on a hit by pitch and runners will be on first and second. The real first difficult scenario for Noah Barros. Pitch 
pitching coach Mike Spears is going to come out and have a conversation with his starter tonight. Sun's still out here past 9 o'clock on Saturday night. Like last night when we had a hour-long weather delay that kept us out of commission from about 8.20 to 9.20. It was a similar theme where bedtimes were extended and weekend fun was had here in the Flathead Valley. As right now, the crowd has not died an inch since opening pitch. Definitely has gained a few bodies, but we got to see what happens here as the OO about to come in with no outs in the top of the sixth. First pitch in there misses low. No bodies up yet in the Glacier Range Riders bullpen. 77 pitches now thrown by Noah Barros. We're at the point where starting to keep a tally on it. I'm sure is Nick Hogan and the staff, especially with that miss there. Count now goes to 2-0. 78 thrown by Barros. The man at the plate is Nick Gatewood. 0 for 2 today. As he grounded out twice. Ground out here could mean two. Maybe three if we're ever so lucky. No, that one will be hit to right field. Carrying back. And off the base of the wall. Bologna misreads it. One will score. Newman will get sent home. But then the stop sign will be put up late by... Newman, who is a lot more power than speed, and so he gets held up. It's an RBI double from Nick Gatewood, and that will get some action going in the bullpen for the Glacier Range Riders. Thompson scored on that one. And now Keaton Greenwald, who's two for two today. The two singles steps up. That one goes up the chimney as Noah Barros does not have a read on it. Dean Miller eventually calls everybody off, and he grabs that one for a crucial out number one. If runners were on first and second, that would be an infield fly rule. But the infield fly rule... Obviously not called with runners on second and third because there's no force out other than first base in that situation. Barros's 80th pitch there was caught for out number one. Up steps Brandon Riley. He's 0 for 2 today. Both times up, it has been double plays, and that one misses by just a little bit off the outside. He was the one that lined into that double play in center field that was the backfire of the hit and run as well as a ground ball into a more orthodox double play. That one hits the zone. Call the strike. Count is now one and one with one out. Sacrifice in play, but you saw a little bit of a taste of Newman's speed there on that deep double that was deflected the Unexpected way off the wall for Vinny Bologna. Newman not able to come around and score off that one. Now a 1-1, misses, count goes to 2-1. and one. Five to one is our score here in the top of the six. The shutout is broken for Noah Barros. But two possible runners stand in scoring position now, and he's just trying to limit that and keep a little bit of distance between the paddle heads and the range riders, but it will not happen. One will score on a base hit, and the second run will come home as well. Trevino not able to get that one in time to apply the tag. A two-RBI single 
from Brandon Riley makes it five to three. The deficit cut in half in one swing of the bat. Anders Green, the man now stepping up. This game just got a lot more interesting and it has taken the life out of the Glacier Range Riders crowd here on this Saturday night. Called strike there. And some deep breaths as there is another run in scoring position and Technically, tying run is at the plate for the Paddleheads in this long top of the sixth inning. Barros has thrown 22 pitches in the frame. By far his longest inning. That one swung on a miss. Count goes to 0-2. No action going on in the Missoula Paddleheads bullpen, so it seems like it will be Munch to come back out here, who had one scored against him last inning. That's the reason why it's not 4-3 right now. But the 0-2 with one out and a runner on second pitch coming in. Just misses inside. Got the batter Anders Green to turn away from it. Count goes to one and two. As I believe it might be John Buclair warming up. Buclair has a certain way that he pitches over there. It's very unique. As of right now, he's standing off the mound, kind of still casually. Allowing Barros to get out as the runner will be going. And a complete misthrow by Luis Trevino. It'll be a wild pitch on that one in the dirt. And then Trevino just completely skipped it by the third baseman Miller. Nowhere near him, closer to the third base coach than the third baseman Miller. Clearly rushed it. And... It is now five to four after the E2 scores Riley from second after the wild pitch. Two two is our count here. Now nobody on, tying run still at the plate. But nobody else to worry about as the fourth run of the ball game is across for the paddle heads. Two two coming in. That one will miss. And Barros, who hasn't really changed his control all that much, just the fine-tuning of it to catch the corners of the zone has changed microscopically and enough to have the calls not go his way. Foul ball there. We're going to do a 3-2 again. A ball will put the tying run aboard for the Missoula Paddleheads who are storming back down 5 nothing. Already a pitching visit we've seen this inning. 3-2 coming in, called strike three there. And Noah Barros, a huge strikeout to get the second out of the inning. This inning started with the number two batter, Thompson singling, and then a hit by pitch, an RBI double, and a two RBI single made it five to three in favor of the Glacier Range Riders still, but it cut the deficit to one. And we had that wild pitch E2 to get the runner in from second. Big swing and a miss from the catcher. Henderson Perez, who's 0 for 1 today, has walked in his most recent trip to the plate. Henderson Perez out of Libertador, Venezuela. And he fouls that one off over to the top of the rocks area, and it'll bounce all the way into the kids' zone. Counts now 0 2. Like the catcher, Luis Trevino, the catcher for the Paddleheads, and his most recent stop in Grand Junction. Both of these catchers fresh out of the Rockies squad there. And, of course, not the affiliated with the Rockies squad that Grand Junction once was when the Pioneer League was a rookie league affiliate of the MLB. 1-2 coming in. 
Thought about it, didn't go. A little bit high, crowd doesn't like it. Turn 23 just eight days ago did Henderson Perez, and he sees that one down the middle of the plate, and Henderson Perez doesn't like it. He is still talking with the home plate umpire. Maybe lucky to be able to allow to stay in this game after that one, as usually player or umpires do not take a ton in terms of arguing balls and strikes, but a long 33-pitch inning puts four across for the Paddleheads. However, the Range Riders still lead 5-4. to four. We head to the bottom of the sixth. Four runs on three hits and an error last inning for the Missoula Paddleheads. Quick conversation happening right now between the home plate umpire and Mike O'Connell, who's an assistant coach for the Glacier Range Riders. O'Connell actually is a Kalispell native, a graduate of Glacier High School. One of the first graduates of Glacier High School, if I'm correct because that was the newest double-A school that was put together in Kalispell. I know the first full graduating class, I'm pretty sure, maybe it was in the spring of 2011, I think Mike O'Connell was a 2010 graduate, so he didn't go to all four years there, but maybe I should just check with him before <laughs> making stuff up. But he was a member of the Glacier Wolfpack. Most recently, assistant coach at Miles City Community College, the baseball program there. And now back home, over covering the first base coaching duties as well as being responsible for all the data and analytics side that has become such a part of every level of baseball now. Sets up and takes down all the cameras. And I wonder what he was talking with that home plate umpire about. Probably just asking the Flathead Valley resident. The umpire was, you know, where a good place to uh, eat after the game was. So the umpires will probably just eat in their temporary clubhouse home <laughs> as their post-game meal will, of course, be provided to them. 2-0 coming in. Now a 3-0 to Brant Broussard, who will patiently wait for a pitch that probably doesn't have the green light on. Munch will hit the zone on that one. Through 23 pitches in his first inning of work. Two seasons at LSU, Brant Broussard started the majority of his 97 games at second base. That one will be a strike. Count is now 3-2 and two, from 3-0 and oh to 3-2. and two. Broussard, I think I've already mentioned, has a great positive spirit. Clearly one of the leaders on this team because of the experience that he has and leads off this inning with a base hit into shallow right field. 
And that just doesn't just mean the leadoff batter aboard. It means speed at first for the top of this lineup to work with. Ben McConnell, who's 0 for 1 with two walks and a fly out to short. He is using a new bat after he broke the red one that he was using in his most recent bat, at bat when he cracked it on the float out to short. Squaring to butt, pulling back is McConnell. But I mentioned more about the, the character of Bruce Sard, two-time member of the SEC Academic All uh, Honor Roll. And a pickoff attempt unsuccessful over to first base. He was also a member of the all-tournament team in 2019 for the LSU Tigers. That one called a strike. Looked like it almost missed off the plate, but just glanced a corner of the zone. One and one, no outs here. Bottom of the six, five to four. The Paddleheads trail the Glacier Range Riders. Pickoff attempt over to try and get Broussard. And Broussard comes from an LSU athletic family. His dad, Burke Broussard, was the starting second baseman for LSU's first College World Series team in 1986. So if Burke's watching, happy Father's Day to him. One day early, there will be a message actually that will go out on the video board tomorrow during Father's Day from a handful of these players, including Ben McConnell, who I actually was down there on the field watching him record that video and wishing all the fathers out there, including his dad, a happy Father's Day. And McConnell goes down on a strikeout after that check swing is called a swing by the home plate umpire. And there's one gone in the top, in the bottom of the sixth. Sam Lynn Scott comes on. Lynn Scott has had an incredibly successful season and an incredible successful run in his first couple games as a Glacier Range rider. That is going to be the end of the day for Munch. We're going to get a pitching change here. I'll read you the unofficial final line on him because he is responsible for Broussard in a second. But first, I'll tell you about that success from Lynn Scott, third on the team right now after four games games played is one for two today so his batting average is, go is going a little bit up started the day at a 438 batting average no home runs but a triple a double and five rbis it's good for a slugging percentage of 625 for lynn scott the right hander will see a right on right matchup here as will tell you about the new pitcher when we come back. We'll take a quick break while we see some more of pitches.
Back here, we are in the bottom of the sixth. There's one out and a runner on first in the form of Brant Broussard. Sam Linscott steps up to the plate. We'll see the new pitcher, Cody Thompson, who comes in. And a swing and a miss from Linscott to start off the outing for Cody Thompson. No relation from Cody Thompson to Cameron Thompson, at least not that I would know of. They're not from the same hometown. They don't have a ton in common. They're at least listed here. But maybe they're distant cousins because I guess we're all related in a way, aren't we? Cody Thompson stands 6'3", 200, 25-year-old out of Mechanicsville, Virginia. Finished up his college career at Randolph-Macon before heading to the Gateway Grizzlies most recently. That one will miss. Count goes to one and one. This season, he has been one of the top choices of relief for Coach Michael Schlack. A 3.0 ERA, one win, no losses, and seven appearance, and nine total innings. That one is a fly ball. Fallon out of play. Count goes now to one and two with one out. Strikeout to walk ratio for Cody Thompson is 12 strikeouts and four walks. Randolph making a really good D3 school at, I mean, in a lot of sports. Got a solid baseball team as well down there in Ashland, Virginia. And right now, Broussard is standing at second. That last pitch was a foul ball. And Broussard's standing at second, and I thought I missed something. And Jason Newman was the one who had to point it out to the home plate umpire. And I don't know if somebody's going to go down there and pull up the YouTube feed. Because <laughs> I just missed completely what happened. I think Broussard just advanced to second on the foul ball. And nobody told him to go back, so Broussard stayed there. I <laughs> Listen, everybody else, you back up your YouTube feed. Tell me what you saw. But I don't know what that goes down as. I guess a stolen base for Broussard. If what happened just happened... Uh, that, yeah, I'm going <laughs> to. All right. Swung on. It's a pop-up in the infield over to shortstop. Watley is there. Watley fields for out number two. I, I don't know what I, what I put it at. I'm still confused when I put this Broussard Advancement to second on a, we'll call it a stolen base for now. <laughs> if, he, if he really did what I thought he just did, could have swore that was a foul ball. I'm completely rethinking everything. I was really immersed in reading the stats there from Cody Thompson. <laughs> but Jason Newman, who was out on the field and clearly paying attention, not happy about the fact that the umpires let him stay on second there. Livingston Morris now steps in. 0 for 2 today is Morris. And a big swing and a miss from Morris who comes out hacking. This crowd knows whether they were here on Wednesday night or whether they follow the range riders on social media. The power that Morris has. His most recent hit in this stadium was a two-run home run over the right field wall, right over the Budweiser sign, that red sign that you can see there. Broussard takes a big secondary lead, but scampers back to second. That one misses low. Count goes one and one. The 
best part about that night on Wednesday was not his tying home run in the bottom of the ninth, which was great. It was not the game-winning home run in the knockout round, which he hit, but it was definitely when I went down to grab an interview with him after the game and grabbed him out of the clubhouse. And as that one is popped up, it is heading over near the dugout and out of play. It was definitely when I grabbed him from the dugout and we were walking out to go back to the field to do that quick interview. And there was a man and his son there that were waiting for him to come out. They had a ball for him ready. They asked him to sign the ball and take a picture with the kid. And that is what this level of baseball is, is all about, the closeness between fans and players and that ability that you, you don't get at the MLB level with players that, you know, are constantly getting signed to affiliated MLB contracts. This one is fair down the third base line, and it's going to be off the – the throw's going to be offline, and Newman will be kind of barreled over by Livingston Morris, and he jammed his hand there, I believe, and that was a collision between two big guys right there. Expect to see something like that as Livingston Morris. Make, make sure to tap up with him. I mean, I don't know what that's going to go down as. Maybe a base hit there as it looks like Livingston Morris was going to beat it out and then call it an E. Five, maybe maybe even not an error in order to get the run home. It is six to four as Brant Broussard ends up scoring on that. And that's where that stolen base, whatever that is, comes in really handy for Broussard. A savvy play to get to second and stay there until somebody told him to move and nobody ever did. And he ends up scoring from second on that play. Newman's still shaking off his right hand a little bit, but he seems okay. Back ready for play. And Miller tries to take the leather off the ball with that one. Comes up empty, count is one, count is 0-1 oh now. Fouls that one back now, 0-2. Oh the other thing about Morris, other than just how nice he was with the man and his kid who uh, he signed the ball for and was really appreciative of them coming out and asking for his autograph after the game and his picture, is when he collided with the Billings catcher at home, I was watching back the tape on that. His first instinct when he collided with the catcher at home was to, he immediately went down as that one hits the finger of Miller. And so it's going to go down as a hit by pitch. The pitcher Thompson doesn't like it. He thinks that hit the bat before it hit the finger. as now we're going to have more conversations as as we just we just got an ejection I believe of Jason Newman. I think Newman just got tossed out of the ball game because he was talking with his pitcher maybe he was trying to calm down his pitcher. I don't know what was just said on the field there Newman not happy about Broussard being allowed to advance to second on whatever happened there. Then he was I don't think thrilled with what happened with Livingston Morris, not necessarily with what happened with Morris, but maybe thinking that there was some sort of contact with him. And maybe it was actually Thompson that just got tossed, not Newman. And he is still turning back and having words with the umpiring crew. As he was frustrated there, Thompson was, with Dean Miller... Not being called to have hit that with his bat first. And I believe he has to leave the yard. But he's still in the dugout right now. And he's just pacing around there right now, expressing his frustrations. He know, knows that unless that was called an error, which actually there is an error on the board. Yeah, so I believe that was called an error on the Broussard score. So it will go down as an unearned run right now against him, but there's going to be two on. <laughs> and Miller is going to come out of this ball game, it looks like. Get a pinch hitter here as 
a new pitcher needs to come into the contest. And Cody Thompson is having to take the walk out finally now after cooling down a little bit in the dugout. But you can understand why he's upset, especially if, if you went back and looked at whatever happened with Broussard there because that would surely make me upset if I was a pitcher and I got a foul ball and a runner was able to advance on it. Again, I don't know if that's exactly what happened. I don't have the time to go back and look at the replay. Thompson now trotting back in. Is that Thompson that just turned around and trotted in? Or? No, he's still out there. A different bullpen pitcher is going to have to come in cold now. Livingston Morris, when I looked up, he was talking in center field <laughs> with, the, with the center fielder. And we still are waiting for who's going to come in as the pinch runner over at first for Dean Miller. <laughs> this is, uh, I always say it. I always say it on broadcast. You see something new every night when you go to a baseball game. And sometimes it's something small. And sometimes it is like the past inning we've had the top half of the inning was fairly weird with the four runs coming across for the paddle heads in different fashion but this one man i'm gonna i'm gonna have to rewatch this one when i'm half awake tomorrow morning and maybe i'll make more sense of it there when i'm a little bit sleep deprived than right now when i'm a lot of bit sleep deprived the new pitcher for the missoula paddle heads his number 27, John LaRosa. He's having come in cold. I don't know exactly what the protocol is here for warming up because, in theory, the ejection of a pitcher should, you know, it's, it's a penalty of some sort for the paddle heads. It's not like soccer where somebody gets toss on a red card and you have to play a man down it is just a, an abbreviated uh, warm up of some sort here you also don't want the pitcher to get hurt of course by sending him out there completely cold so I don't know exactly if he gets the amount of time he wants which is the protocol in an injury situation if the pitcher has to come out the New pitcher gets as much time as they want to warm up where it seems like right now it's closer to that because John LaRosa is taking his time. So Thompson will be responsible for the runner on first and second. Right now I believe it's an unearned run against him with the Broussard run that was scored earlier. It's 6-4 to four in favor of the Glacier Range Riders where he got two outs in the bottom of the sixth inning. And I will say... I don't know if I ever finished my story about Morris because things kind of got crazy before I did. But while we finish up these warm-up pitches, Livingston Morris, if you go back and watch that game against Billings where he barreled into the catcher on Wednesday night, his first instinct was his hand went on the back of the catcher. You know, the natural human reaction of, oh, my goodness, are you okay? Because, you know, I, I just trampled over you. And clearly it was incidental from Livingston and – and he, for a second, was thinking about caring for the catcher before pivoting his body and tapping home plate to make sure he was safe. It wouldn't have mattered because the catcher was called for blocking the plate. But um, you could tell Livingston's a guy that enjoys playing the game of baseball, but he also enjoys the connections that he makes through playing baseball and you know, with his reaction over with Newman over there after he collided with Newman and maybe tweaked his hand, the first thing he did there was make sure that amends were made. As we see, I'm just looking over at Newman on first right now talking with Dean Miller, and seems like he's still kind of frustrated in how he's, talk in how he's talking. He's, he's outnumbered over there because it's Mike O'Connell, who I opened up the inning, this inning, I believe, or maybe it was last inning, talking about the local native who he's talking with, who's the first base coach, as well as the man who just got hit by the pitch. Actually, that's not Dean Miller over there, is it? I think it is still Dean Miller. 
Yeah, it is. No pinch runner over there. But Brody Wofford, everybody was just convening at the b in, over in the dugout. Um, and now the warm-ups are finally done for John LaRosa. For some reason, I decided to talk through all of them, and I hope you followed at least one or two of my trains of thought. Brody Wofford steps in. He's going to have a runner on first and second, one of the weirdest innings you'll ever see just happened. And again, you can, you can rewind. These games are archived. You can go back and check this one out for yourself. And my confusion of all that just happened will live in infamy on YouTube. First hit is up the middle. Livingston Morris rounding and getting the stop sign. By, from Stu Peterson, the third base coach. Probably a good call. It looked like the ball got into the outfield just a little bit too quick there. But it'll load the bases from the number six batter, Vinny Bologna. Bologna had a home run over the left field fence right in front of the scoreboard earlier today. And now with two outs can expand this lead again for the Glacier Range Riders who coming into this inning all the way back at the end of the fifth inning, they were leading 5-0. Now it's only 6-4 after the Paddleheads had four in the top of the inning. The pitch goes low. Count is 1-0 now. On third is Morris. Miller's on second. He's got decent speed that you saw a little bit on that pickle that he got out of. Wofford over at first. And Vinny Bologna, one for three with a two-run homer at the plate. 1-0 coming in. Big swing and a miss, and the crowd reacts to it. They know exactly what he was thinking on that one. If you go back to the start of this inning, it started on a single into right field by Brant Broussard. Since then, <laughs> there were two outs, and then chaos ensued. Some point, Brant Broussard got to second, some sort of stolen base. That one is a swing and a miss, gets by. The throw home is not in time, and they're going to run around a healthy lead from third, or a healthy turn from third from Dean Miller. Thought about trying to go home, but even if you get a good bounce off the wall there, it's still really tough to make any of those plays. So it is a swing and a miss, a swinging strike, but then call it a wild pitch, I presume, for out or for... The run to score. It's 7-4 to four now in favor of the Glacier Range Riders. Wofford moves up to second. Miller now to third. Vinny Bologna still at the plate. A 1-2 and two count coming to him. Two outs. Still RBIs on the board for him if he can get a base hit. He cannot. A swing and a miss for Vinny Bologna. Ends the frame. But there's two across for the Glacier Range Riders. An ejection. A stolen base on a foul ball? Question mark. And a uh, wild pitch run scored. <laughs> we'll be right back for the top of the seventh.
The day is done for Noah Barros, who threw the first five innings spotless before the Missoula Paddleheads finally got to him in his final inning of work. For Barros, six innings full, seven hits allowed, four runs, three earned, nine strikeouts, a professional high for him. Two walks and a hit by pitch as well. That's a 4.5 ERA for the day. Minimized the damage in the end, which clearly was very important because this is a close ball game for John Bucolaire to come into. Bucolaire, originally from California. I don't know why I said that. Maybe he's not from California. I don't have a hometown listed for him, actually. But he played his college ball in Michigan with NAIA Madonna University before playing last year in the American Association with the Sioux City Explorers. First pitch from Bucolaire misses the zone. Called ball count is 1-0. He leads off against Jared Aikens, who's 0 for 2 today. Swung on, broken bat, floating to Brant Broussard at second base, who makes the catch on a run for out number one. Let's flip over the lineup card for the fourth time today for the Missoula Paddleheads. And a man who's got a ground out, a walk, and a strikeout swinging. Buclair just two pitches thrown, and if you can see there on the Fuzzy lone camera that we have for this opening series. He gets down to this low, I mean, it's like a, I don't even know how to describe it. Squaring to bunt, pulling back, called strike. It, it is the most peculiar of setups of this pitching staff for the Glacier Range Riders, that's for sure. But whatever works for you and for Buke, it, it has worked Pretty well, foul ball there, count goes to 0-2. The stats on the season for Bucolaire. This is his first week with the Glacier Range Riders. An 0-1 record and 2-1 and thirds innings pitch. One strikeout, one walk for him. He's had one good outing and one where he got touched up pretty good. The entire crowd wanted that one and like you, I am offset from home plate, so I don't have a good sense of inside, outside. <laughs> and of course, the crowd is biased, but the best I can do is rely on the people who got the seats behind home. And they seem to think oh, that one was a strike. <laughs> but like I said, they're biased. One, two, one out. Pitch coming from Bucolair into Watley. Crowd again wanted it. That time I think they were asking a little bit too much. Wally still tapping the toe. As it's a long look, Wally's ready for it. He's locked and loaded. Stepping off is Bucolair, and he's going to have a quick conversation with Trevino. Make sure they're on the same page there. Just missing on two pitches that would have punched out Watley. And this game, every game, every sport comes down to a few plays, sometimes a few calls. And both of those pitches there missing. Bucolaire and Trevino hoping it doesn't come back to haunt the Range Riders. 2-2 coming in to Watley. It does not come back to haunt the Range Riders. A swing and a miss. And we got two gone here in the top of the seventh. John Bucolair looking to go one, two, three in his first inning of work. The bullpen yesterday so strong for the Glacier Range Riders. I mentioned about it in the opener. We went into the hour-long lightning delay, and, of course, that took both the starting pitchers off the shelf, and it was the Glacier Range Riders bullpen that came out and Absolutely suffocated the Paddleheads' bats in the latter four innings. First pitch coming into 
Cameron Thompson fouls that one back. Up and over the, the net behind home plate and up and over the press box. We had one hit a part of the press box right next to me last night. That was the first time one has really thudded on here and scared the heebie-jeebies out of me. 0-1. Down Main Street. Called strike. Thompson got the rally started when he started off the last inning on a ball that just went under the glove of Broussard, who was pretty deep in the hole and was scored a hit. 0-2 now. Tenth pitch of the inning. From Bucolaire to Cameron Thompson. Swung on, foul ball up and over and out of play. Top of the seventh here. It is seven to four. The Glacier Range Riders lead the Missoula Paddleheads. Nobody is on with two outs as John Bucolaire tries to finish off his first inning of work versus Cameron Thompson. Bucolair sets, kicks, and fires. Another foul ball back. This one catches the netting. And we'll do 0 2 1 more. As Bucolair refuses <laughs> to miss the strike zone, or maybe Thompson refuses to not swing at a pitch and doing what he can with it. The Billings Mustangs did so good against the Glacier Range Riders with these two strike foul balls. That is their key, definitely in the first series between the Mustangs and the Range Riders. But it was also a big factor in the second series as well. Swung on and missed. A strikeout for John Bucolaire. He struts off the circle as we head to the bottom of the seventh. Bottom of the seventh here. Glacier Range Riders lead the Missoula Paddleheads 7-4. Another seventh inning stretch here at the ballpark Flathead Field. Just opened less than a week ago. We are on day five out of six straight games. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been a blast from the knockout round we got on Wednesday night to the Lightning delay that people stuck through and watched the rest of the game of last night to now tonight, seeing a handful of things that don't think I've ever seen before. It has been a blast thus far. 48 total home games in a Pioneer League season, so plenty more chances to come out here, see the ballpark, eat the great ballpark food that we got here, even though it's limited concessions to, you know, hot dog. Hot dogs, pretzels, 
Cracker Jacks, peanuts, a few other snacks here and there, nachos as well. I'm trying to remember what's on the concessions menu. Not down there a lot, obviously, during the game. 0-2 oh now on Trevino. Misses outside. Count goes to 1-2. and two. Trevino, 1 for 3 with an RBI today. As well as there's plenty of beverages as well, all sorts of pops and Powerades as well as a good selection of beer here at the ballpark as well for those who are age appropriate. One and two is the count. No outs here. Trevina leads off this inning. I was telling our concessions manager, Hannah Kelly, you know, hot dog is the staple ballpark food. No, no doubt about it. Hot dog and baseball go well together as we get a swing and a miss there from Trevino. He's down on strikes. Austin McNicholas will be the man to come up and face John LaRosa now. But despite how hot dog and baseball are so closely related and they're, you know, they're almost one and the same, just like America and America and baseball are, you know, related so great. You throw a hot dog in there and that is that is that is a trio that you know, can go together pretty well. I think, for me, there's just something about seeing a glistening, you know, big soft pretzel when I walk up to the concession stand. There's been multiple times when I've gone to a concession stand with the intention of getting a hot dog or a hamburger or something like that, and then I just see with a beautiful, you know, golden brown soft pretzels and order that instead, and I'm never disappointed. One and one now after the swing and a miss. One out. My question is always, sometimes I like salt, sometimes I don't. And they ask me, and I always buckle under the pressure, and I, you know, I kind of tote the line. So that one hits the strike zone. Counts one and two, one out, bottom of the seventh, nobody on. Austin McNicholas, one for three today. Seeing John LaRosa for the first time after the ejection in the last inning of the Previous pitcher, Thompson, for the Paddleheads. Foul ball keeps McNicholas alive a little bit longer. Usually I end up getting the pretzel with salt, and then I get sick of the salt by like halfway through the pretzel, and then, you know, I just kind of scrape it off and kind of, kind of meet in the middle. By the end, it's just... Just straight pretzel. Missing high there to McNicholas. Counts two and two. McNicholas has come on since he has splashed on the scene here in Glacier. Started every single game at the shortstop position. Been really solid defensively. And we'll see the 2-2 two -two swung on and missed. Go down on strikes there. But like I said, McNicholas brought in big part is because of his defense at that incredibly important position of shortstop defensively and this is the man that has no errors at that shortstop position in McNicholas. Love that. And now, it'll be interesting to see what we see here with Brant Broussard stepping up to the plate. Brant Broussard started off that rally last inning and swung on and fouled back on the first pitch there. Just interested to see if there was, you know, some sort of... Uh... <laughs> we just got a race between the two ball kids and... The, or the bat kids, I believe. The bat girl for the Glacier Range Riders beat out the bat boy that's in the visiting dugout and got an ovation from the crowd. That one missed low and away. Counts one and one with two outs, bases empty. You see, it's it's all those things that you come to the ballpark for. That you can get some sense of it here. Maybe you heard a little bit of the crowd on TV. I don't think the camera covered it, so unfortunately you missed the visuals of it. But live sports, anything can happen. As that high pop up. Speaking of anything can happen. That one is up and over the screen and falls into the bowl seating here for a souvenir. 
One and two now, two outs. Speaking of ballpark foods and, and souvenirs, at the Helena Brewers games that I attended a lot of, they were one of the teams that had a deal as that one's going to go way out of the ballpark foul. Still one and two. They had a deal like a handful of other minor league teams had where you could trade in a baseball, a foul ball that you got. You could trade it in at the concession stands for a free hot dog. When you're a kid, that's a great deal, especially when, you know, your mom gives you limited money and, you know, you're, you're just a little bit hungry and, you know, maybe your mom said the money was for, you know, some sort of at least dinner-esque type thing, you know, a burger or, or a hot dog or something like that, and you spend it on a bowl of ice cream, then and you start to need the hot dog eventually and you get the foul ball and maybe you cash it in. This one is hit off the ground. Going to be a tough play. Bare hand, no throw. Brant Broussard, an infield single. And uses the speed. And now he's going to be perched at first next to Jason Newman, who was the most verbal in the, uh, in the argument for Brant Broussard being allowed to advance to second the last time he was on base. Again, I don't know what actually happened. As this one is hit, going to be a better chance for Watley to field and throw, and he gets it in time to get the Speedy McConnell out. Six to three. It's still seven to four. We head to the eighth. Jason Newman leads off the top of the eighth. We've got a new pitcher. It's Tanner Solomon, who pitched two innings last night, but getting used to his new role as a relief pitcher when he was mostly a starter at Wayland Baptist. Fires that first one in over the strike zone. Called strike count is 0-1 to a frustrated Jason Newman, who has let the umps hear it all day, but also probably fairly frustrated that he's reached base all three times that he's been up, and the true testament how much of a team sport this is, is somebody can have a crazy day and go completely off. Newman with two singles and a hit by pitch, not doing exactly that, but still having a really good day, and you can be frustrated. 
with the amount of difference you can make as the Paddleheads are down three and he leads off this inning with the bases empty top of the eighth. One and two is the count. As Solomon kicks and fires, called strike three, a backwards K, and Newman is having a quick conversation. Eh, maybe more than quick. And another paddlehead playing with fire there. We've already seen one ejected. I thought Newman got ejected earlier, but it was actually the pitcher Thompson that got tossed as Newman was trying to calm him down. And Solomon is working quickly here. That was something I talked with him about last night. He got the post-game interview. You can watch most of that interview online with some of the highlights from his night last night. That one misses as well. Both of those not by much. But it was against the leadoff batter, Watley, that Watley took exception to how fast both Solomon was pitching and how fast they allowed him to pitch. This one high, and it's going to get out of play too far away for Dean Miller. 2-1 and one is the count. One out here, top of the eighth. I do have confirmation from my mom, who is one of the over 100 people watching this broadcast right now. She went back and watched the replay, and it seems the Prampersard did advance to second base on a foul ball in that last half inning. Some of you probably went back and watched it for yourself, and that one hits the zone. And it'll keep Gatewood from walking down the first. He'll have a 3-2 pitch with one out bases empty coming up. Swung on. That one's going to be cracked into the gap, and it's going to land in front of Bologna, who took a bad angle to it and a stand-up double there for Nick Gatewood. Puts him on second with one out. Of course, the... There's no natural grass in the outfield that plays the ball a little bit slower than you would expect. So I, I think Bologna just kind of lapsed him there. And that one skipped off the turf and went a little bit quicker off the turf than, turf than seemed like he was planning for it. Still did get to it and did not let it get all the way to the wall. Only two for Gatewood. Stepping up now is Keaton Greenwald. Two for three today is Greenwald. That one skips, kept in front of the catcher enough to stop Gatewood from advancing to third. Did forget to mention that it is a new catcher in there in the form of Justin Mazzone. Should be batting for Luis Trevino. Foul ball. Count goes to one and one. One out, runner on second here. It's a 7-4 ball game in the eighth inning of play between the Paddleheads and the Glacier Range Riders. 1-1 one, one pitch coming in from Solomon to Keaton Greenwald. That one will miss. It's not getting those calls on the ones that are near the zone for Solomon. His outing yesterday was a huge benefit for his stats, just... Helped him just that little bit better. A 4.70 ERA and three appearances. Seven and two-thirds innings pitched. Seven strikeouts to four walks. That one will miss. Count goes to three and one now for Solomon. One out here. That one will be a high fly ball. Broussard backpedaling, gets called off by the center fielder. <laughs> Lynn Scott, very confident in calling off Broussard there. As that one was high, but Lynn Scott locked onto it, knew he could get there. And the talent that the Bleacher Range Riders have in this outfield, they got a lot to play with in terms of Lynn Scott and McConnell for sure. And then in the right field position. They can put somebody that has a pop, either Bologna or Livingston Miller, who that's the only place we've seen him when he's played in the field. Today he's DH, and of course now two outs with a runner on second, and that one will miss. A 
I saw him and I talked to him a couple times yesterday. And the thing that, you know, he really talked about is just enjoying being kind of immersed in this atmosphere and just how much of an experience it is for him. And it's a learning one. Oh, a little bit of a testy catch over there in left field. You didn't get to see it, but it seemed like McConnell might have lost it late, but he still reaches out to the left and makes the snag for out number three. So a stand-up double in the top of the eighth, but that gets the Paddleheads nowhere. It's 7-4 to four as we head to the bottom of the inning. Back here in the bottom of the eighth inning, it's Sam Linscott to lead it off. Linscott grabbed the second out of that last inning, and it's still John LaRosa on the bump for the Missoula Paddleheads. Came on after the ejection of Thompson two innings ago. Has pitched one and a third inning since. Swung on foul ball, not able to be caught by the catcher, but just a tip there. 0-1, no outs. It's 7-4 in the bottom of the eighth inning. The Missoula Paddleheads... Need three runs, at least in the top of the ninth, to extend this game any further than the top of the ninth. Fans here sticking around as knocked off balance by that swing and a miss is Sam Linscott, one for three tonight. He's now behind 0-2 in the count. We'll see Livingston Miller for sure in this inning as well as Dean Miller there on deck and in the hole respectively. 0-2, no outs. Linscott to receive. Just kind of slaps at that one. It's a high little popper to second, but fielded and put on first in time by Thompson. A check swing that could have done something decent with it. As Livingston Morris now walks up to the plate. Already talked plenty about him. He has a game day tradition at every home game day. I don't know what he does exactly on the road. But at least home game days, he walks in through the main gate, the gate that the fans walk in through. Learn that because the day after his walk-off home run in the knockout round, he was down on the field talking with manager Nick Hogan, and <laughs> here comes Livingston walking through the concourse rather than going straight to the clubhouse. And then out through the kind of player's entrance onto the field from that temporary clubhouse over the right field foul line. That one misses away. Counts now 2-0. One out here, bottom of the eighth, nobody on. And the main question that Nick had was, did you park where the players are supposed to park, not where the fans are supposed to park? And once that was cleared up, Livingston confirmed, yes, he did park where the, where the players are supposed to park and then took the long route in as that one is laced into left field. Off the glove of the left fielder, Riley, and all the way to the wall. Livingston Morris will get into second. 
It was a run that Riley was on. We'll see if it goes down as an error or a double. It was a healthy hit ball, but definitely a, a chance to go either way because there was some ground that had to be made up by Riley, and he was sticking his hand up to his left. He was, I wouldn't call him fully extended, and it is going to be called an error, so a two-base error. But nevertheless, a, a great play by Morris there to just put some good pace on that ball and get it to the outfield in a hurry. And whether it gets scored as a hit or an error, it puts him in scoring position with one out for Dean Miller, who now has a 1-0 count. One out here, runner on second. Couple glances from LaRosa, who will throw that one over the heart of the plate. Counts one and one, and I just looking down at the people behind home who are frustrated with some of the calls that Tanner Solomon has gotten. And Dean Miller as well, just like Jason Newman did. Disagreeing with the home plate umpire a little bit. One and one with one out now. Big swing and a miss from Miller. Count is now one and two. Unless we get a double play here, we're going to see Brody Wofford, the first baseman, who sits on deck. Seven to four here in the bottom of the eighth. Looking for some insurance right now. Is the Range Riders. We'll see if Bucolaire comes out. I mean, excuse me, Solomon comes out to finish off. It would be four innings of good work if he can finish it off in just the past two days. Don't know where that one missed. Looked like it caught part of the plate, but maybe the heckling from the audience got to the home plate umpire a little bit as that borderline pitch goes as a ball. Two and two, one out, runner on second for Dean Miller, who's one for three today. Throw over to second to try and catch Morris cheating a little bit too far away from the bag. <laughs> it is it is so cool being here in a brand new stadium and hearing fans that come out and they, they know baseball. I mean, they have clearly been itching for this team. You know, they, they know <laughs> they know the right times to boo. That's a big thing. If you pick off somebody that, you know, they know he's probably not going to steal. I mean, I don't, I don't – Morris has good wheels when he gets running, but, you know, he's not – he's not been the steal type guy. And so when you pick him off at second, and then you take a long time to throw the next pitch, and then you have a meeting at the mound, well, as you can hear, these fans know that's the time when you boo, I guess. You can go eight hours – down the road to Seattle and watch a game at T-Mobile Park and see those fans who have had the Mariners in town for I don't know how many years, 30 plus years at least. Or T-Mobile Park, previously Safeco Field. It's been around since right about 2000. And they know, they know the baseball obviously really well from going to all those games. They do the exact same thing. That one's just off the knees of Miller. Count will go full for the cleanup man. We've seen him in left field, right field, third base and first base, as well as DHing in his Galatia Range Riders career. He was with the squad since the beginning trip to Colorado Springs. Dino to see the 3 2. Swung on, hit to second, one hop fielded and thrown over to first base. The ground out to second will be the conclusion of the payoff pitch. Now Brody Wofford advances. Morris, I mean, Brody Wofford advances to the plate. Morris stayed at second there. Didn't get a good jump on that one. Just wanted to play it safe there. He'll be running on contact with this one, though. 
as the first pitch will come into Wofford, who is one for two today as he slapped a single right up the middle. Swung on that one, goes all the way down to one knee, does not make contact with the ball, though. The count is 0-1. Oh, 1 Two outs. La Rosa. Two full innings trying to get to two and a third and give him, his team a better chance in the top of the ninth. Now swung on good contact over near first. Mike O'Connell thought about fielding that one, but then remembered it's getting a little colder out, and I don't got no glove, so I'm just going to let that one go to the Missoula bullpen. Oh, 1 now. Or excuse me, oh, 2 after the swing and the miss and then the foul. Made it so, 0-2, runner on second, bottom of the eighth, seven to four, two outs here. Brody Wofford ready to receive. Misses there, and La Rosa doesn't like it. A little kick of displeasure for both sides. I mean, usually there's constant disagreements with the strike zone, of course, but both sides really feeling like, I guess, It'll even out in the end, maybe, with all the question marks they've had around the zone. One and two. Swung on to second. Should be a playable ball for Thompson. And it is. He throws to first for out number three. So Morris gets to second on the E7, but he is stranded there. And we head to the ninth. It'll be a save opportunity if somebody new comes in. It'll be a save opportunity if Tanner Solomon stays out there. It looks like a new man coming in from the bullpen to act as the closer. We'll introduce him when we come back for the top of the ninth. The closer tonight for Nick Hogan's Glacier Range Riders squad is the big man, 6'9", Austin Steinvort, stepping on the bump to give him a little bit more of that height advantage over the batter. Steinvort comes on. For him, this is his ninth appearance of the year. Only nine and a third innings pitch, so he is very much a short distance type guy, at least that's the role that Nick Hogan wants him in. He likes him in this closer role, ninth inning, eighth inning, late in the game to come on and pitch a solid inning. And when he's really found that, that's where he's been successful. So this is ninth appearance, a 1-0 record for Steinfort. Opposing batting average, opposing batters are hitting 375 against him and he has eight strikeouts to six walks and that's a big number for him because last year the walk numbers are really what stung him. That one hits the zone called strike. When he played for the York Revolution in the Atlantic League, 61 walks in 48 and two-thirds innings pitched. That was 
where he went wrong for sure. And that is something that clearly he has worked on this offseason, and though it's early, is the key for him going forward. Blowing up the strike zone because clearly he has a great fulcrum to get good stuff there with the 6-9 frame. That one spiked into the dirt count is 2-1. and one. So you go from almost a foot of difference in height between Tanner Solomon to Austin Steinfort. I don't think any of these batters that are up now saw Tanner Solomon, however, in that one inning. This one's hit over to third. Dean Miller, Miller fields, and he throws on target on time for out number one. I assume it would be... A little bit of a little bit trippy though. The change of release point coming from you know Solomon who stands 5'10, 5'11, I believe. Don't know exactly what he's listed at. Actually, I should know what he's listed at. I have the roster right in front of me. He's listed at 5'11 on the roster. That one will miss high as Henderson Perez. We'll see Steinfort with one out. But you go 5'11 to 6'9. That is a 10 inch difference on the release point in theory. Has to throw you off a little bit. And Steinfort grunts that one in there. Swing and a miss to make it one and one. One out here, base is empty. Henderson Perez 0 for 2 tonight at the plate. Swing and a miss there on that high fastball. It's now one and two. Another thing you can hear from Steinfort possibly is usually upon release of the ball, let's add a little bit of a, of a grunt, almost like a tennis player. And he grunts that one by Henderson Perez. A swing and a miss for out number two. And the final hope for the Missoula Paddleheads is Jared Akins. Akins, two strikeouts and a fly out to second base. He is the last chance for the Missoula Paddleheads. An out means a save for Austin Steinfort. A hit or any other way that Akins doesn't get out. As that one just gets a piece of it, foul ball. <laughs> Another race to the ball. This time it was won by the kid coming out of the visiting dugout. So they're one-to-one -one on the night. Maybe we'll see another foul ball right behind home that they'll race to. Swung on and missed. Jared Akins behind 0-2. And Austin Steinfort one strike away here from completing a Saturday night victory over the Missoula Paddleheads. Steinfort gets the sign, sets fires on the mound. Swung on. It's going to get between the shortstop and the third baseman. And the crowd will prepare to see another batter before they can let out possible cheers for a Saturday night win. Aikens 0 for 3 night now has a 1 for 3 mark, but somebody who steps up now We'll try and do the same thing. Kevin Watley, 0 for 3, two strikeouts and a ground out. A walk as well, though, for the shortstop from the Paddleheads. First pitch misses high. Count goes to 1 and 0. It gets real interesting if Watley's able to reach base because then you get to a point where the tying run comes to the plate. Thompson on deck. Newman, you don't want to get there. He is in the hole. Down the middle, called strike. One and one, two outs, runner on first is Akins. Kevin Watley will see the one one as Steinfort fires. Swung on this one, hit out to center field. Lynn Scott has a track on it and catches it for out number three. Steinfort fired up as he pounds his chest there. And the hometown Glacier Range Riders have already clinched a series victory over the Missoula Paddleheads. The defending champs come to town, and right now they will just look to not get swept tomorrow in the Father's Day matinee. What a performance by the Glacier Range Riders. They come out, and probably their, 
I think definitely their best home start of the year. They get out to a 5-0 lead behind a miraculous start from Noah Barros. And then Barros gets touched up a little bit in the sixth. He has to come out. Then they hand it to three relievers that all, with little wiggle room, get through their innings with nothing against them. It's another great job by the bullpen, which in this league, man, games can change once you get into the bullpen. But for the past two games against these Missoula Paddleheads, the only thing that has changed in the game when the bullpen has come on is really some opportunities for the Paddleheads have quelled into almost no opportunities for the Paddleheads in seven total innings pitched by the bullpen. They've just allowed one total hit to the Missoula Paddleheads. That's an incredible number. Actually, it's two total hits, excuse me, um, but it's still an incredible number, and you got to tip your cap, cap to the three relievers in Bucolair, Tanner Solomon, and the closer, the man who gets the save, Austin Steinfort. We please, please, please encourage you to come down to the stadium, join uh, the fans in their rousing support of this squad. Should be a lot of fathers out uh, with their kids um, tomorrow. So whether you are, you know, a, a father wanting to come out with your kid or whether your kid wanting to take your father out to the ballpark tomorrow is a great time to do it. Should have good weather. We have had during the games all week for the most part, other than a little sprinkle here, sprinkle there, with the exception of Tuesday, We've had great weather, um, and there's great concourse coverage area here as well for when it does kind of pitter-patter a little bit. Again, it was a great start from Noah Barrow. Six innings and allowed three earned runs on nine strikeouts and two walks. But the highlights for sure, you got to look down at the Vinny Bologna two-run shot that really put the Glacier Range Riders in the driver's seat, and from there... Well, from there, they did what was necessary to get the win. I'm going to have a fun time going back and looking at whatever the heck Brant Broussard did on that foul ball. Like I said, my sources told me <laughs> it was, a, it was a quite literally a true steal of second as, it, it, you know, stealing in the real world is illegal. And, and I think what he did technically was not a legal play. That is our ball game. The final line score for Missoula, four hits, uh, or four runs on nine hits and two errors. The Range Riders have the same amount of hits, and nine, but they had seven runs and just one error to come from it. A great performance by the Glacier Range Riders, and they get the job done here at Flathead Field. A seven to four victory over the Missoula Paddleheads. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. My name is Scott Gladstone. I hope you all have a great rest of your evening, and please stay safe out there.